school, we're actually the second educators in your children's life because you are the first teachers. And we want to work in partnership with all of you because we can't do this work alone. podemos lograr grandes cosas para nuestros hijos. I love the diversity of the school district. Whether you know it or not, this district speaks 83 different languages. Every child, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of income, regardless of need, every child deserves to have their needs met. No one person can do it alone. The teachers can't do it alone. Administration cannot do it alone. It's going to take the parents, the community. I'm very thankful for the partnerships that we have with our communities in both cities that represent our school district. We always ask the question, how can we even do this better? And I think that's where community schools come in because that takes us to the next level. All right, welcome to the February 1st, 2024 regular Board of Education meeting. Um, the time will be given to speakers at the discretion of the board chairperson uh, for any items that wish to be commented on for closed session. I don't see any public comments in front of me here. I don't see any online. Uh, so superintendent brings us to item A, uh, call to order and roll call. Would you mind calling the roll? Yes, Mr. Clark? Here. Ms. Larratt? Here. Ms. Lofthouse? Here. Mr. Reed? Here. Mr. Hooley? Here. All are here, thank you. Thank you. Uh, item B then is, uh, Announcement of items to be discussed in closed session. In a moment, we will be going to closed session where we will be speaking about the following uh, student matters, employer-employee relations, conference with legal counsel, conference with real property navigators, and personnel matters. Uh, and item C, public comments for closed session agenda items only. Uh, there were no public comments. So that does bring us to item two, closed session. We'll be back in open session at 6 p.m. Call us back into session. Uh, we're at uh, welcome for those of you who weren't here earlier to the February 1st, 2024 regular Board of Education meeting. Uh, we will start with item four open session. Uh, we've just done a call back to order. If you'll please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And that brings us to item C, broadcast statement. A broadcast and recording is being made at the direction of the board, and the broadcast may capture images and sounds of those attending the meeting. Folsom Cordova Unified School District Board Policy 1313 promotes mutual respect civility, and orderly conduct among employees, parents, and the public. We will treat staff, parents, and members of the public with respect and expect the same in return. If any member of the public uses obscenities or communicates in a demanding, loud, insulting, or demeaning manner, the board will calmly and politely admonish the person to communicate civilly. Public comments during board meetings are an important component of public engagement and transparency. Members of the public will not be permitted to yield their speaking time to another member of the public. All written comments submitted by 3 p.m. today to the board have been read. Per the Brown Act, the board is not allowed to enter into a two-way discussion on any matter not on the agenda. That brings us to item D, roll call. Superintendent, will you take roll? Yes, Mr. Mellager. Here. Mr. Merrill, please note for the minutes, Mr. Merrill's absent tonight. Mr. Clark. Here. 
Ms. Larratt? Here. Ms. Lofthouse? Here. Mr. Reed? Here. Mr. Hooley? Here. All are accounted for. Thank you. Thank you. And that brings item five, reporting out of closed session. Item A, reporting out of closed session actions. Superintendent, anything to report out of closed session? Yes, three actions were taken in closed session this evening. Uh, the board voted unanimously to approve a resignation and settlement agreement for a classified employee number 612962. Pursuant to the agreement, the classified employee will receive a lump sum payment of $4,045.70, uh, equal to one month's pay through January 31st, 2024. The second action, the board voted unanimously to approve a resignation and settlement agreement for classified employee number 606108. Pursuant to the agreement, the classified employee will receive a lump sum payment of $14,147.46 for two months pay through March 31st, 2024. And the third action, the board voted unanimously to approve a resignation and settlement agreement for a certificated employee number 609320. Pursuant to the agreement, the certificated employee will receive a lump sum payment of $32,933.60, four months pay, no later than 30 days after the effective date of the agreement. Thank you. And that goes to item six, adoption of agenda. Before we move to adopt the agenda, I did want to make a recommendation, if the rest of the board is okay with it, that item 12, discussion, we switch item A and B so that we first discuss district-wide transitional kindergarten, and then we discuss follow-up with superintendent search firm. Uh, so if the board's okay, is there a motion that we adopt the agenda with, uh, with that change? I'll move it. Motion by Mr. Clark. I'll second. Second by Mr. Melajor. Superintendent? Mr. Melajor? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Ms. Larratt? Aye. Ms. Lofthouse? Aye. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hooley? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's, then brings us to item seven, special presentations. Uh, item A, students. I believe we do not have any special presentations from our students. That's correct. Okay. Item B, staff. And again, we have no presentations from the staff. That's correct. Okay. Then on to item eight, public comment. Time will be given to speakers at the discretion of the board chairperson. The law allows the public to address the board on any matter not on the agenda, but the law prohibits action by the board on non-agenda items. I do have a few in-person public comments. Um, you'll have three minutes to speak. Uh, we'll start with Erica Graham and followed by Josie Bosart. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Erica Graham, and I'm a parent of students at Blanche Prince Elementary. I think most of you are aware that recently there was an incident on campus on the uh, Monday the 29th. An individual was arrested on campus um, for a violation of a, a firearms um, warrant that was out for him. Uh, my concerns are the lack of protocols that I feel like that were in place to alert families of what was going on, to alert staff of the details of what was going on, and to open a dialogue between concerned family members and the district. My hope is that by speaking here today that the district can review those policies, that they can take steps that will cause immediate action when there's a suspicious person on campus. This person had been on multiple campuses within the district and the lack of communication between the various <laughs> school sites probably caused a delay in this, um, this gentleman being arrested and having his situation dealt with. Um, I appreciate that the district has sent, or that the school board has sent out a, another comment to the families, giving them more information on what's happened. Um, just moments ago, the comments came out. But I feel like there's still not a dialogue that's been open for families to ask questions, to express their concerns, and to get their questions answered. That's my time. Sorry, you can continue. We had forgot to start the timer if you have oh, more to say. No, that, that about sums up my concerns, okay. though. My, my hope is that um, a dialogue can be opened immediately for families to express their concerns and that the district will review the policies that um, fell short here in getting this communication to the parents and to the staff. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Josie uh, Bissart. Bissart. Josie, you got to tell me I got it at least closer this time. Uh, Maya Pogan Paul will be next. Hi, it's these are it's a Bizarre. lot of balls. Yeah, it's weird. Um, get there. But yeah. So Welcome. hi, my name is Josie Bizarre. Um, I'm a Blissett Delago High School senior. Um, so I'm here again to speak about recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day on the second Monday of October. 
So this is the fourth board meeting I've attended over the course of the last three months. I know some of you guys are a little bit more familiar with me now. And the group that I'm working with has attended five board meetings in total. So we're all very grateful for the opportunity to talk with you guys. I think this is really cool, like being able to speak with the people in charge. Um, but beyond seeing Vista de Lago student concerns addressed at the last meeting, we are a little bit disappointed this issue has not been put on the agenda or gotten any results. So we know there's like many important things that you guys, the board, are discussing and working with, many more than we see here at these meetings in this like hour or two or three or four. But we feel as though we keep being pushed to the side. And I believe this issue is important, and not just to me or the multitude of students that are here with me today, but to students across the district. So the mission statement of the Folsom Cordova Unified School District states that the FCOSD, or the Folsom Cordova Unified School District, is committed to providing excellence in educational programs through our commitment to continual cycles of improvement, transformative social emotional learning, and engaging culturally responsive instruction. And if this is the district mission statement, then I think we should be following that. I googled what culturally responsive education is, and that's a teaching that uses students' customs, characteristics, experiences, and perspectives as a tool for better classroom instruction, according to eggweek.org. And if we want our district to be culturally responsive, if we want to be able to respect students' experiences and their perspectives, then we need to start acknowledging their experiences and perspectives. And celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day is a way that we can start recognizing one of the many different experiences and perspectives in our area here. It will help be our district more inclusive. It'll help students feel connected to their heritage or their classmates, and it can help empower families too. So this change, I believe, is necessary. And we will keep showing up to these meetings until you guys, as the board, are able to make a decision. And I know that board member Clark has been advocating for us, so thank you for that. And I hope the rest of you will follow this or take this concern under consideration. Thank you all for your time. Thank you. Uh, Maya Pogan Paul, followed by Albert Titman. Welcome. Hello. Um, my name is Maya Pogampol, and I'm speaking once again on behalf of recognizing the second Monday of October as Indigenous Peoples Day in the Folsom Cordova Unified School District. This is the third month my group has been here to advocate for Indigenous Peoples Day. And while I know board member Clark has been pushing for Indigenous Peoples Day to be addressed, we are disappointed that there has otherwise been no action taken. As students in the district, your constituents, we feel our voices haven't been taken seriously. Adding in Adding Indigenous Peoples Day to our district calendar is a small change, yet recognizing this day has a large symbolic significance. Personally, I would find this day meaningful because it is a step against culture loss, which is something I myself have worried about with my own heritage. Having a day to recognize Indigenous culture means that we are remembering these people and what they have fought for. Maya Angelou once said that no, that no one of us can be free until everybody is free. This sentiment has been echoed by a variety of people throughout history including civil rights leaders like Fannie Lou Hammer or writers like Emma Lazarus, to name a few. And we, are, we must always progress to ensure freedom and equality for all. To be free, we must also advocate for inclusion. Already, we have days like Martin Luther King Jr. Day, which has provided students like me the opportunity to learn about one of the most famous civil rights leaders of all time. I'm grateful that we recognize Martin Luther King Jr. Day and to keep moving forward, we must keep fighting for inclusion and equality. Adding Indigenous Peoples Day to our calendar helps us move forward and can make help and can help make our district more inclusive to all. And it's disappointing that this hasn't been done and that this isn't on the agenda. We are just hoping that you address this issue, which we have repeatedly brought up. If there is a reason not to add Indigenous Peoples Day to the calendar or this topic to the agenda, then we ask that you address that so we know how to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Albert uh, Titman, followed by Michael Duncan. Hello, members of the board. Uh, just want to uh, offer gratitude for hearing me again. Um, it's the second time I've been um, present to speak on behalf of the parents and the families and the students, especially these young students here today um, who are advocating for Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, my name is Albert Titman. My tribal heritage is Nisanan Miwok. Uh, Maidu and Madesi Band of Pit River people are, are people who have existed here since we believe the beginning of time, right in the area where this entire region sits. 
in any direction 100 miles. And so um, I want to say thank you again to, to our superintendent for uh, reaching out after our last meeting and inviting us to have a, a personal meeting. And so I want to acknowledge the board for that and uh, to really encourage you to, to listen to our indigenous relatives because the Title VI funded program that we're advocating for in the district supports the education, the awareness, and the inclusion of our Native students and their families. And I think most of you are aware, we just learned that there are relatives that do understand Title VI. We were introduced to them and we're looking forward to speaking with you in hopes of developing a uh, Title VI funded program in the district and to be an advocate and an advisor for those families. And I just wanna remind you all that um, our organization, the Native Dads Network, has been instrumental in other counties and in the city of Sacramento to help develop, really establish first and develop curriculum around Indian education. And we have more than 700 identified uh, students, whether self-identified or federally enrolled tribal members in this district. And historically, our people have existed here. So I don't know if I'm overly concerned about why there isn't an Indian ed program uh, versus uh, why I'm excited that for the future of Indian ed in this district. And I want to be a strong advocate and, and, and maybe an educator as well. And so thank you. And thank you to these young people here because it, it was, I don't know if it was coincidence. I believe in our spiritual ways that it just so happened the last time we were here, they were here. We didn't plan it, but man, creator is powerful in our belief systems. And so we don't think those things happen by accident. And so I, I wanna applaud those young people because they're speaking out like the youth have a voice. And here they are, they're speaking loud and clear. And it's up to us as, as parents, as grandparents to, to advocate for them. But man, how powerful is it? You know, our future's in good hands. And so I just wanna say thank you again for giving us this opportunity. We look forward to, to the 12th. Thank you. Michael Duncan. Welcome, Michael. Good evening. I'm glad to be here. Again, uh, my name is Mike Duncan. I'm a Round Valley tribal member um, from Mendocino County. My tribal heritage is Maidu, Wintun, Wailaki on my father's side. On my mother's side, I'm Western Ban Shoshone Tomoke. And I'm a proud uh, California Indian, you know, and I reside currently in Woodland, California, and I serve as the executive director of Native Dads Network based out of Sacramento, California. And I'm here also to support the, the Native American Parent um, Committee um, that's being formed in this, in this area. And like Albert said, I want to thank the superintendent for inviting our group to participate in, into, um, into future meetings in the future. And I am also inspired by the youth that came up here on their own to change, um, you know, the day of Columbus to Indigenous Peoples Day. And I would think this is what I, I think when we look about historical intergenerational trauma and we start to look at other districts and other districts that are making huge strides of catching up to the future. This is, this is today. This is now. And we're still talking about Columbus as a founder, <laughs> a discoverer of a country that was stolen and taken from our people. So one of the things that we've been really instrumental in, in a lot of different um, communities and in, in developing an Indian education program in Woodland and also um, in Twin Rivers, it's just in Sacramento, is really trying to prevent indigenous erasure. And so when we talk about education and the architect and the, the foundation of education was to assimilate the, the Indian child, kill the Indian, save the man policies. And so it's really vital today that when we speak about um, truth and we lay down things on foundation, we start to look at the things that are already policies and systems already put in place, right? Like certain holidays, the way that we pledge allegiance to the flag, the way that we speak about maybe land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the first people that are here. We just acknowledge it. We say, hey, this, the first people here were the Miwok people, the Nisanan people. We acknowledge it. And that's a step forward into the future, right? We start to look at things that we could do to protect all of our youth in this district. We talk about the Native youth. How many generations of Native youth has come through your, through your district that was unprotected? 
or not even spoken about. They were just looked at as numbers, right? And so I'm speaking as a father today. I'm speaking as a, a, a survivor of a, an ancestor to survive through Holocaust genocide. Um, and that I have the privilege to come here today and share goodness, love, reconciliation, and, and talk about how we can protect our future generations about, um, from the things that um, maybe harmed our people from the past. Thank you for the time. Thank you. I have no, uh, no more in-person cards. Is there anybody online? Nobody online. Okay, that brings us then to item nine, reports of district organizations. We'll start with the student advisory board. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good evening. Our next SAB meeting will be Wednesday, February 7th. We will be providing important stakeholder input at our meeting with McPherson and Associates next week to get a perspective on what students would like in our next superintendent. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Manager. And California School Employee Association. Hi, thank you, board. Um, happy to report we got back to negotiations yesterday. Yes, the negotiations went well. We were able to get a lot accomplished. We were able to settle on MOUs number three and 10, um, PD days, which makes classified staff very happy. We're glad that one of these days is gonna be, as we call, mandatory. <laughs> um, and also a uh, restorative specialist and relations to that job and MOU number three. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Nothing else to report this time. Uh, Folsom Cordova Education Association. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so good evening board, FCUSD administrators and our teachers from Cordova High School who are in attendance. This is the second time this week I have been in attendance at a board meeting. Monday was interesting. Um, though, this, though school services determined that the feasibility of splitting the district was a no-go, it appears that if the city council of Rancho will continue down this pathway, I understand the frustration of the community who feel they were always in the back of the line when many resources were handed out and it never quite reached them. And in the past, that may have been true, but I feel that this present board and future boards will keep in mind their first professional governance standards. Keep the district focus on learning and achievement for all students, supporting tenants continue with this theme. The first one, recognize that children come to school with diverse educational needs. Two, base decision on district's vision, student needs, research, empirical data, and a balance of community expectations, legal constraints, and resources. Three, ensure that the district has established academic standards and regular measure of growth and achievement for all students. And lastly, to ensure the district provides opportunities for all students to succeed. The overall standing and the underlying aspects can be seen in some new processes like giving true local control in the sites with their own supplemental funds. Also the dedication of Kate Kassarian, Carla Davis, and all of the site-based contact personnel with their work within the community schools. These schools are carving out a safe space for the community's needs and wishes, along with providing extra supports for our scholars and for their families. As we heard at the last regular board meeting, they are making strides. But as we are in the infant stages of this work, it takes a while to see true growth and the statistical data to support these initiatives. So instead of fighting amongst ourselves, duplicating staff with two new districts, which also duplicate cost, let us focus on what's important and what this district's board's true responsibility is in educating all students. Good evening and thank you. Thank you. Uh, Folsom Cordova Leadership Association. Good evening, uh, Dr. Kaligian, board members. Tonight we have a presentation from Innovations Academy and Walnut Wood Independence, and it's gonna be presented by uh, Kim Walker, Principal Kim Walker and her assistant, Ann Botsford. Thank you very much, board, for allowing us this opportunity to come here this evening and showcase some of the special things that we have going on. Thank you at uh, both sites and thank you leadership team as well. Um, if it's going to work. Am I using it wrong? Oh, there we go. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I 
giving you a sneak peek to everything here. <laughs> okay, so um, as Dr. Kligian does with all of our leadership meetings, um, showcases really what is our guiding light in everything that we do. So it's our four equity questions and then also our roadmap. And with both of our sites, we have a roadmap too with um, where we're taking our where we're taking our um, identity with our students and with our sites and where we want to go into the future. So both sites, Walnutwood and, in, and in, uh, Innovations, are both independent study schools. And so what does that actually mean and how do we support the communities of Folsom Cordova? Well, independent study is designed to respond to the unique educational needs and interests and abilities of all the students. And it allows us to provide a variety of alternative educational options for the communities that we serve. So we're gonna um, break down just a little bit of what the two different sites look like on a high level. Walnutwood High School serves um, high school students from 9th through 12th grade. It's a traditional independent study program with one-on-one -on -one support, um, anytime from one day a week to two days a week, and sometimes kids come in a lot more often. The magic of the program is the individualized plan that our teachers create with their students. And we also have in-person events in order to still foster a sense of community um, within our school. Innovations Academy serves students from first grade through 12th grade. It is a virtual school with more of a traditional schedule, so they meet their teachers every day. High school goes and middle school goes through different periods, so that mirrors what that part would look like um, from a traditional site. However, we do have the opportunity to provide more individualized support with small group instruction, and we also do have in-person events and are able to take that instruction to a new level. So just so you can see what the sizes are of these two schools, we are small, but the work that our teachers do is very mighty. So you can see for Walnutwood and Innovations, um, <coughs> each year we start out fairly small and we grow. Um, so looking at Walnutwoods year over year, their average from growth from, um, let's look at after COVID, because um, it's a different ball game prior to COVID from last year, from um, August to April was about 31 to 32% and innovations growth was 40% um, from August to April. So we do have these equity questions that Ann and I review and look at our decision making when we're coming up with new initiatives or um, wanting to enhance our program. So that is here for us to review as well. And then we thought we'd take it down just a little bit closer to what does it actually look like in, in our schools. So for priority one, for looking at empowering students success and growth, because we are able to give that one-on-one -on -one attention, um, we're able to create some special pathways for our students. And here's some examples. The bottom two pictures there are um, individualized uh, pro um, projects that our innovation students have created during our um, um, diversity day, where they're able to really kind of dive in deep and be able to find um, self-empowerment so that way they can be able to meet their goals. And I'll have Anne showcase some of the Walnutwood ones. So, so you can see the picture up on the top, and that's one of our educators. She actually came from Mills Middle School, um, and this is her student that graduated in November, and he is currently attending school in the community college. He started his community college um, education while he was attending Walnutwood High School. Um, he'll be one of our speakers during our graduation ceremony. So it just goes to show the one-on-one -on -one and then also offering those um, dual enrollment opportunities for our students that are attending Walnutwood High School. It's that one-on-one -on -one opportunity that really um, allows our teachers to be able to take the students from where they're at in order to help them move and meet their goals. So looking at priority two in partnership with students, families, and our community, we look at this with our community as well as also their community within our school. So we have a couple pictures here. Um, the one on the top left was the opportunity of two of our students being nominated for the Star Holiday event through Rancho Cordova, um, which was a fantastic event for these kids to experience. Um, below, we have our, again, our diversity day where we had our younger elementary school students that were putting on a school performance for the school. And then the one on the right-hand side is a picture from last year from our entrepreneurship fair. And what was really special about this is that we had our seniors who are in their economics class who were mentoring the um, fourth and fifth graders in creating products in order to sell. And um, we don't have pictures, however, a Walnutwood also has a fantastic partnership with our community as well. We also have a program, it's called the Adolescent Parent Program. That's for teens that have 
babies. And so we have started a program for them to learn CPR for adults and also for children. So that's something else that we've partnered with our community and also with the help of the district. Um, <clears throat> We also have a program called 916 Inc. And that's um, a, well, not a catalog, but it's a book that they put together of um, collected work that the students put together. And that's also for Innovations and Walnut Wood. Um, we have many partnerships, um, one being specific that we started this year with our CTE programs in conjunction with Kinney High School. They have a culinary program. So that's helped us with building partnerships within our school. And looking at priority three in fostering a diverse, inclusive, and thriving work environment, these are just some pictures of both sides showcasing our students working together and how they support the diverse groups. Um, they really have a say in what that environment looks like. So when, it, when you come to um, a work environment for their students, it could be um, alone where they're studying by themselves. It could be working in small groups, as you can see, and then it also can just be a time for them to get together and to do social events. And that's what you see there at that bottom picture was celebrating the end of the semester in the hall, the hard work that the students did. Um, we also have uh, opportunities for students to be able to decide what does that environment look like so they have a hand in creating um, that educational environment. And if you see that um, the picture on the bottom left, that's our Folsom site. So we not only have the Rancho Cordova site for our Walnut Wood students, we also have a satellite office that's on the campus of Folsom High School. We're very fortunate to have that because we also are concurrently enrolled in some of the programs that they have that we don't currently have mm -hmm. for our students. So we're very fortunate that our students can go to this Folsom site and then also to be able to still take classes at the Folsom High. Um, up at the top, you're gonna see these are students that attend Walnut Wood again and they um, got together socially during October and they uh, painted pumpkins together. It was a nice social event that they had. So together we're including all of our students. They're always welcome to come to our site um, to participate in some of the fun activities and socialize that they normally would have in a comprehensive site. And we have another um, pick, a few pictures here for priority four, which is optimizing systems and the culture of innovation. And so um, I'll let Anne continue to speak about uh, the Walnut Wood sites that we have because there are different learning environments. But those bottom two pictures um, are pictures of innovation. So we have on the bottom right there, that's our first, second, third grade combination class. And they took a new class picture. <laughs> so that's their little silly class picture of all of them together um, during their live instruction with their teacher. The bottom left that you see is actually one of our um, that's our sixth grade classroom. And what is really impressive to watch is the level of deep engagement that students have in a virtual setting. It's not listening to a teacher just lecture and um, across the screen. You have, in watching my teachers teach, they have students that are participating in guided notes, digital manipulatives, um, digital um, uh, um, simulations, as well as collaborating on whiteboards, collaborating in breakout rooms together, and this is all happening within the same 45-minute class. So we really are trying to create within both of our programs, um, with Walnutwood and Innovations, a reinvention of an extension of what the classroom looks like so that way we can support our students. Um, did you want to talk more about that one? Well, that was, again, that's okay. another, that's another um, picture of Folsom, the Folsom site mm -hmm. that we have and optimizing our systems that we have in place. It's either on a comprehensive site, like a CTE or an elective course. Um, we also have dual enrollment for our students that want to attend a college course through Los Rios um, or another program You know where we work well with our community and then also with our school sites that our students are able to mm -hmm. connect with both. So again, coming back to that, that final purpose is our purpose here for alternative education is meeting the students where they're at, finding a home for them, no matter what that educational environment looks like, and being able to develop those deep relationships one on one so that way they can empower themselves to meet their needs. And these are just two pictures of our two sites, um, obviously during um, the holiday time. <laughs> so thank you so very much for this opportunity to showcase our alternative education sites and any questions. Hey, thank you so much. Any questions from the board? Uh, yes, Mr. President. A couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, you all had the um, Dea Dos Los Muertos, I think Day of the Dead celebration. Are you guys bringing that back anytime soon? I know it was a, you know, a lot of kids participated in that. Yeah, and it was, 
and it was a great event. So I'm just wondering if they had any interest in bringing it back. There absolutely is interest in bringing that event, including other social events. It has been slow going since coming back from COVID, but mm -hmm. that is a goal of ours is to increase that social um, opportunities for our students. Okay, and with 916 Inc., I know they had a big thing with that. Is that going to come back as well? It actually, yeah, it is back right now. It is an elective for our Walnutwood students, and they have um, actually their presentation um, coming up. I think it's February 20th. Mm, I don't want to say the wrong date. It's in my calendar, but they're getting ready to do that presentation. Yeah, is it possible to keep the board? Absolutely. Yeah. I'll send that to you. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Can I do a shameless plug? Of course. <laughs> um, I presented you guys with a flyer that we have. We are having an open house for, um, and that's my Wisconsin accent. Um, we're having an open house for our independent study and also the, uh, the Innovations Academy. It's on February 22nd. We invite you to come. Board meeting. Oh, you have a board meeting. Oh, I'm so sorry. But we welcome you if you'd like to come. <laughs> It'll be a great event. <laughs> um, oh, it's but, the 15th. My bad. It's the 15th. Oh, then you can come. So we, so we come. expect you to be there. <laughs> Wait. That's correct. Yeah, is it just the 15th? It's the 22nd. We're free the 22nd. Oh, we're free. <laughs> Fabulous. Then you are welcome. <laughs> Um, we're going to provide snacks and, um, you know, and, and drinks of the nature that it should be. Um, but anyway, we want to encourage you to come take a look at our program. We're going to have our teachers there. We're also going to be inviting um, students giving testimonial about what the program has been for them. Um, and we welcome you to come and anyone else. That's why we gave you the flyer. Great. Thank you so much. I, I don't have any questions, but I would just point out two things that stick out to me. One, what a great testament to see the rise in attendance uh, each year and knowing that your programs are doing a great job to make that happen. And then second, I just want to say, I, I really love the idea of the upperclassmen coming down to work with the fourth and fifth, uh, fourth and fifth grade. Um, what a great opportunity to have some peer to peer support and work. So thank you for all the work you're doing and for the presentation. Thank you. All right. And yes. And last uh, but not least, District English Learner Advisory Committee. Good evening, Elena Cabrera um, here. And good evening, Dr. Sarah Kaligian, um, Superintendent, President Hui, members of the board, and my esteemed colleagues. I have a brief update tonight. Some of this information you've heard, but this is um, one of first and foremost. Uh, an invitation to our parent summit this Saturday. As you know, we have three parent summits throughout the year for representing um, um, different information or presenting different information to our parents. The focus this coming Saturday is on the data walk, an opportunity to engage with our um, educational partners, the parents specifically in this case, and get feedback on the data, what they're seeing. It's a, it, many of you have attended, so it's not, it's not something you're unfamiliar with, but it's a really great opportunity to engage with the data, have discussions around it, and then voice concerns or compliments as they see them. So looking forward to seeing um, your participation on Saturday if you can make it. And um, additionally, I wanted to update you on the January 9th meeting that we had. I know it's been a month, um, but um, it was at Cordova Lane Center. And um, a couple of things that really were highlighted, and it came from our school representatives, our schools have ELACs, English Learner Advisory Committees, and they come to our, our DLAC meetings, the district level ones, and provide information about the school. Of course, they take information. There was an exchange there in conversations. They were really excited to share the work that the schools are doing surrounding supporting our English learners. We know that we need to continue to support our English learners, and they were eager to share what they're doing, not only to help ready them for the LPAC, which is a state testing that's taken place starting today, and uh, wishing our students the best and really giving them, arming them with the preparedness that they need to succeed. And um, always fun to, to announce where we are today with 262 students, which are English learners that have been reclassified. So while we have work to do, there are successes. And right now there's 262 of them that we're just deeply proud of in their work. And last but not least, um, we spent some time doing some data walk preview and then helping ready our, our parents to help communicate the need to have their voice and um, share any, again, con concerns or compliments that they have that we want to continue um, to respond to. And, um, and then last but not least, we had a needs assessment throughout the district. 
And it isn't only centered on English learners, it's all student needs. And we had close to a thousand individual parent feedback. So it was really a tremendous effort um, by I think the parents and, and of course staff, but their word of mouth and their participation um, really um, shown this time. So that's our report today. Thank you. Okay, thanks Ms. Correa. All right, that brings us to item 10, agenda consent. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the agenda consent? Mr. President. Yes, Mr. Correa. I'd like to pull item C. Oh, of course. All right, item C, we'll pull, pull item C, approve revised governance handbook. Any other items from other board members? Yes, please. Can we uh, pull item G? And pull item G, approve selection of firms to provide value engineering services. All right, I'm not hearing any, any other. So do we have a, a motion to approve agenda consent minus uh, item C and item G? I'll move. All right, motion by Mr. Melajor. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Ms. Lofthouse, superintendent. Mr. Melajor? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Ms. Larratt? Aye. Ms. Lofthouse? Aye. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Huey? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. And Superintendent, do we have any announcements from agenda consent? Yes, we do. We have an introduction to make, and one of the items the board just approved was the personnel action form. So uh, Folsom Cordova is pleased to announce one of our newest uh, administrators to the Folsom Cordova fami family. Miss Joanna Horning is the new assistant principal at Mitchell Middle School. Come on up, Joanna. And just a brief bio here. Miss Horning is a familiar face. She's been in Folsom Cordova since 2021. With over 16 years of professional commitment to her community, Miss Horning has a diverse background, ranging from representing low-income clients as a lawyer in a nonprofit law firm to teaching foundational reading skills as part of the academic intervention team at Cordova Villa Elementary. Her career has been defined by a passion for public service and a profound dedication to making a positive impact. As a former IB student herself, she has a unique perspective to be a leader of our MYP program at Mitchell Middle School. In addition to being fluent in Spanish, Ms. Horning brings substantial expertise in data analysis, PLC processes, and the structure and implementation of MTSS. Eager to contribute to the team at Mitchell Middle School, she remains dedicated to serving her community and fostering educational excellence. And with that, we welcome Ms. Joanna Horning to her new position. Congratulations. Thank you. Welcome and congratulations. Okay, that brings us then to item C, approve revised governance handbook. Superintendent, would you like to introduce the item? Sure. At our board study session in December, at the December 11th meeting, we reviewed the governance handbook as we do um, each year and um, just look to see if any revisions needed to be made. We did discuss some of those revisions at that time. Um, we have a copy of the final, but we also have the um, attached of the draft version, which has the edits to it. And I believe the edits are on page 96, which was a holding place for the board's vision and mission statement, which we said we'd come back to. So that was the major change on, um, maybe you can bring up that second attachment, Rochelle. We also added a definition for the Brown Act for the board's request. There's the holding place for the board's vision and mission statements. And then the other edits were on um, dealing with one of our board bylaws, 9012 on board member electronic communication. We crossed it out here. We had it as a link and we said it'd be more appropriately placed um, at the uh, topic on the next page. Um, so we put it under electronic communications under topic 15. Um, so you can see in red, uh, that's what we had talked about adding there. And instead of doing a reference to the board bylaw, we linked it there um, and that the board members would be aware of that. And then the last one was topic 17, uh, was um, how board members are assigned to our board subcommittees. Great, thank you. Uh, so questions from the board, Mr. Clark, would you like to? Yeah, Mr. President, thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to hone in on topic 20. Um, 
to participate in CSBA Master's in Governance program or similar professional development. And you know, obviously the protocol is strongly encouraged for serving as board president and vice president. Um, I'd like to probably see some language in there about board president's workshop that is offered through CSBA at the um, AEC, um, as well as maybe something about tenure uh, on the board to participate, especially serving as a board president or vice president. Um, you know, I, I'm just not a big fan of uh, somebody not serving, you know, you know, like time on the board at least a couple of years uh, before it being even considered uh, for the role of president or vice president. I think there's some additional training, especially with the board's president's workshop or more participation um, in MIG, not just graduating the day of being elected, but at least have some time in between. So hopefully we can send that back um, and take a look at that language and add that in. Any other questions from the board? I think maybe just honing in on that same one would be possibly defining what we mean by strongly encouraged, because I think that that's such a loose term that um, if we want to be more specific, we would want to take out that strongly encouraged and be more specific or kind of define what that means. So maybe expand a little more on, on that. Mr. President, I would appreciate it didn't come to me at the time, but if we could add maybe some clauses about the responsibilities of a student board member and maybe hone in on that language too, because I know that would be very helpful to incoming members who would take on this responsibility. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Reed. Yeah. Um, on item 20, you know, I would be open to having language that says it's strongly encouraged for serving as board president and vice president, uh, as well as, um, or clarify on the left, uh, the president's training as well. But I can tell you firsthand that um, I was never informed that there was a president's training. I found out there was a president's training the day I went to um, CSBA um, because no one told me. Um, so I don't think that that is necessarily uh, uh, something that would, would or should be required. Uh, this, the next year, I asked to be signed up for president's training, only, and I asked early, only to find out it was sold out. So I served two years as president of this board and never was able to take a president's training at CSBA, because one year, I was never informed that it existed. The second year, it was sold out. So I, while I think um, uh, we should add that, I don't think we should go beyond uh, encouraged. If we want to delete strongly and just say participation is encouraged, that's fine if, if people aren't clear what strongly means. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with how this is currently written, but I'm open to adding, uh, rather than say, or similar professional development, because I don't know what that means, uh, you know, participate in, master's governance training and uh, and president's training, and then leave the protocol the same, I'd be open to that. Uh, yes, Mr. Reed, I, and if I'm correct, and I could be wrong, um, I think the board's president's workshop is offered at least twice a year uh, through CSBA. I would have to follow up with one of our pacers, but I believe that it's offered twice a year, so there is ample opportunity to take that. Um, it's not only offered at AEC, it's offered at, um, at, a, at another time, and I think it's during the summer, but I can definitely follow up with the superintendent and let her know. And I'd piggyback on that because similarly, even as, as new board members, when we went to AEC, the new board member um, training was also sold out. So I think that sort of one of those, like, how do we follow up as a board um, to ensure that any members are getting the trainings that, that they either want or need um, for their future planning. And knowing that there's potential new board members coming on before the next AEC, sort of kind of planning ahead of that, of like, we might need two spots for the new member trainings, things like that, just being 
more ahead of the game because I know that both Jen and I came on and we neither of us were able to attend to that um, the first time. So just being aware of when those trainings are and as a delegate, maybe that's part of our <laughs> responsibility is making sure that that information is is shared out in enough time. So um, taking that on as my as a role for myself um, as a delegate to ensure that that information is shared. Um, but there is also that follow up for us as members of CSBA. So yes, Ms. Lofthouse, a good point. Um, actually, there is a board of directors meeting again in March. I can definitely bring that up and actually prepare them. If it's something that you as a delegate want to bring to the floor, we can definitely do that. Because yeah, because one of my comments too with CS uh, with with it is that one of the hard parts is because of the way the California elections roll out, the conference actually happens before they actually call the election as well. So that is one thing that it's kind of hard for a new board member is that you may run into a situation where you're going to the conference and maybe the election hasn't even been called yet. So having those additional board member new board member trainings at alternate times and things like that, because I, I ended up taking one I think like six weeks after over at the SCOE offices and things like that. But um, having those additional times available and things like that, because it's like you're, you're trying to go and you don't even, I mean, I think for administration, it's a little difficult because they're like, who am I signing up for this? You know, or if there's a way that you could just sign up without having and have it as a placeholder, maybe for the district versus a specific person, because sometimes you don't know who that person's going to be yet. Yes, and I believe our executive assistant is going to do it differently next time to make sure that we have spots, whether we have the name, you know, certified at that point, because we can, as long as we have the spot, we can still make a change to the name if need be. So just for clarification, um, Vice President Laird, um, you did have training at SCOE. Was that new board member training? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. So. Yeah. Yeah. So they had it are. like in February after. So. And but. they also had an online version. I think they kind of had to back up because there were so many new board members. They right. they offered more more trainings than normal because there were so many new California board members. Yeah. But and I think it was kind of the first time that the election has gone out that far too. I don't think that had been particular practice. So I think they were trying to kind of figure out how they could onboard all these new board members for people that the conference happened two weeks before or three weeks before the, the call in the election. And then as far as the tenure, I mean, here's the thing about it is that I have was on the master's in governance and there was plenty of brand new board members who were in their first year who were actually already a board president. So I think that sometimes it just comes down to a mix of who's on your board and conversations um, amongst your board. And because I talked to several of them and I said, well, how did that go if you have veteran board members and you're already board president? And she said, well, they elected me. So. I don't think that your tenure on the board can necessarily determine whether you're going to be a good leader or board president. So, I would actually like to know what district sales were. I mean, I can probably find out. Um, but I know in the history of this district alone, it's never been somebody that just got elected and became president. And I'd honestly have to follow up on that because I don't see that as being true i mean well you're I, welcome to yeah i mean I, I would definitely them, look it up yeah, yeah and it was but, one in the it was one in the bay area that had had a strident board and they needed new leadership so okay if it was a brand new board i can understand that i mean if it was a turnover of all five which sometimes is rare especially when elections are on odd and even years but well no they had tenured board members on there and they okay. had two two new electeds and one of their new electeds they elected as a board president as a board so, president okay yeah. Is that because the tenured had no interest in being president? Was that it? Um, I don't know. Uh, she just said that they'd had a strident board previously. So I don't know if it was just that they had a new person that was on there. So I don't really know what those circumstances were. Coming back to topic 20, I would also maybe venture to add bullets. If we're strongly encouraging for board president, I actually think it should be encouraged for all board members. Um, because especially new ones coming on, never never doing anything um, up here and not knowing a lot of the things that we learned through the masters in governance or any of those any of those trainings. I think that not only should it be for the president, vice president, I I honestly think it should be honestly encouraged for all board members. So um, and if we wanted to include the student boards now that they offer the student board conference as well, I I would venture to add those bullets down below. 
Yeah, I agree with you. And not only that, I mean, you know, we just started having a new meeting uh, with discussions on, you know, if you had an interest on being on the board and, you know, if there's interest there and you've kind of been tenured, you know, I, I think that would probably come into the conversation. I can understand if uh, you had a tenure board member that didn't want to be president or vice president. Okay, that's understandable. But if you did have somebody that was tenured, you know, uh, maybe the opportunity should be there for them. Um, you know, the meeting that we had, I thought back in whenever we had it, I thought that was part of the discussion of, you know, would you be interested? But, you know, that's come and gone. And I just wanted to, like I said, hone in on, on topic 20. I just think there needs to be more discussion on that moving forward. I would add, I with the tenure, I guess I, I think, you know, we are five elected officials that elect one another into leadership positions. I think it, we shouldn't put any limits on that. Uh, if, if somebody gets voted in, they get voted in. If they don't, they don't. But that's kind of the democratic process. Um, that's my take on it. Um, I, don't, I don't think it sounds like it hasn't been a problem having, uh, you know, board presidents that are not qualified for the job or haven't at least had a couple of years on the board. So I personally, I wouldn't put language in there around that. If we want to say encourage to serve or encourage to go to the Masters of Governance, I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, I, I think we too, I have no problem with CSBA. I think we too often put uh, all of our faith into CSBA and maybe less in each other. I guess let me be the test case because I've never gone to Masters in Governance and I've never been to the board president's workshop. So ultimately, at least the way I see it, the role of the board president, it doesn't differ very drastically from the other four board members. There are some other responsibilities, but we're, we're ultimately pretty much all doing the same things. Uh, so if we're, you know, if our colleagues think that somebody's qualified to do that, we vote them in. That's, that's, I, I guess I would keep that as the process. Um, I, I wouldn't probably have any CSBA language in here, but I'm okay with leaving something like encouraged to attend the master's in governance. Um, Go ahead, yeah, the, yeah, President Hui, the other thing that, I mean, there's so many different circumstances. Maybe in the future, someone is uh, elected to the school board who has an MBA, who's maybe run the board of directors, president of the board of directors of a major corporation. And to say that that individual, because he or she didn't go to Masters of Governance or to a CSBA course, is not qualified to be president. Um, you know, I, I mean, I certainly think that you can get experience in many, many, many different ways other than just CSBA. Uh, there are even competing um, school board organizations out there. Why are we calling out just CSBA rather than any uh, school board organization? You know, you have individuals who perhaps um, served on school boards 20 years ago. Does that mean that they're not qualified if they haven't gone to CSBA? Um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I kind of feel like this, this language is, is perfectly fine the way it is. But again, I, on the left-hand column, I'm open to, um, you know, spelling out a little bit more of what similar professional development is. I mean. Well, I kind of think you just said it. <laughs> like, I think what you just said covers that similar professional development. I think that encompasses everything you just said, um, because that also encompasses not necessarily just de professional development as a school board member. You might have professional development in your career that qualifies you. And I think that that language right there says that. So I think it covers kind of what you were just saying. So then why, why do we need to change it, I guess, is what I'm coming down to. No, that's not a problem. I mean, I just wanted to bring it up just for the record. Um, obviously, it's uh, up to the board, full consensus, whatever you guys want to do. I support you 100%. So I just wanted to bring it up for the record. Okay, uh, well, 
it is on the table if, if somebody would like to make a motion. Um, if, if I'll move it. All right. Move by, for, uh, sorry, move by Mr. Clark. Is there a second? Approving this? Yeah. Of approving this. Yeah, I'll, I'll second. Second by Mr. Reed. Superintendent? Mr. Mellajor? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Ms. Larratt? Aye. Ms. Lofthouse? Aye. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hooley? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. That brings us to item G, approve selection of firms to provide value engineering services. Dr. Kalidian. Yes, this item is coming back to the board per board's request to um, do uh, a process of hiring um, a third party value engineer um, company to look at our design and plans and uh, before we build uh, future projects. So. We'll entertain any questions the board may have. There are two firms that, uh, through the request uh, for qualifications or statement of qualifications, that our facilities team has deemed um, uh, ready to go and recommending to you today. Coming in prime design. Mr. Reed, you want to start yes. us off? Yeah, thank you. Uh, no, I want just first of all, I wanted to thank um, uh, staff and the superintendent for um, moving forward with getting a value cost engineer. Um, it's something that I had uh, asked for the, the team to consider. So I, I very much appreciate that uh, this is uh, being brought forth. You know, I, I think, you know, given the explosion in construction costs over the last, well, 10 years, but even more particularly the last four or five years, you know, I, I think uh, this is uh, vitally important for the, uh, district to control construction costs. Um, uh, the only question that I, I have is, uh, can we learn a little bit more about who was selected uh, and uh, how many candidates were considered and what um, brought these two candidates, uh, um, what elevated these two candidates uh, for uh, the, the staff's recommendation uh, that they be considered for our value cost engineers? Mr. Washburn. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. We uh, pre prepared a pretty extensive RFP uh, requiring uh, various elements. We had uh, basically five different categories, five or six categories. We evaluated um, rele uh, experience of the firm, uh, relevant experience for the type of projects that we would typically do, K-12 experience, experience in the local market, local area. Uh, we looked at cost, we looked at litigation record. We had all those categories. We, we uh, advertised for it. Uh, we even tried soliciting some areas as well. And then once we received the um, RFQs, we received from six firms, which, you know, this isn't your typical contractor architect. So it's not like you're going to, you're going from a pool of hundreds of, of people. Mm -hmm. um, we had six, uh, which we thought was good. We evaluated them. We had about five people evaluate the VE firms. We ultimately selected uh, down to interview. We interviewed two firms and we went through that and then we um, ultimately decided on these two firms based on their experience qualifications and their scoring criteria. Um, they were de deemed the best value. We thought about one, we thought it'd be good to have two firms. That way, you know, it's like architect pool, um, depending on how much work you have, you could always divvy it out. If somebody doesn't work out as well, you have somebody else to go to. Uh, both these firms have a lot of experience working in the education industry. They have good references and um, so we uh, recommend them moving forward. And they both have extensive experience performing this particular service, the value cost engineering? Yes, we also looked at uh, value engineering, constructability review, cost estimating, um, you know, developing standards. So there's a lot of different services that we can pick and choose from a, a menu of services. So it's not just value engineering. Value engineering is the main focus of what we're looking at, but a component of value engineering is also constructability review how the plans are put together as well as, and then cost estimating too. So all those components go together and we can utilize the, them in any of these facets as we uh, plan projects. All right, and, and my final question, <clears throat> and, and I'm sure that's not the case, but uh, are there any relationships between these value cost engineering uh, firms and our existing pool of architects and engineers in construction? Uh, no, they're separate firms. Okay. All right, I'm good, thank you. Any other questions from the board? All right, I don't see any questions from the public. Um, there's one online. 
Alana. Alana, are you there? Yes, I am. All right, welcome. Thank you. Um, this is Elena Wagner. I have been, you know, following this very closely, and I really appreciate you guys hearing the community's concern about the cost of these new facility projects. Um, I just wanted to know if we had any idea about the potential cost of this step. Um, looking over some documents from the district, it looks like about sixteen and a half million dollars have been spent on facilities designs that are now not able to go forward for. Mather Morrison for Folsom uh, Ranch High School plans. And I just want to make sure we're not continuing down that road of, um, you know, spending precious tax dollars um, to a significant degree without results. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I right, bring it back to the board for final comments. Not hearing any. Is there a motion to approve? I All right, motion by Ms. Rhea. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by uh, Ms. Larratt, superintendent. Mr. Mellotor? Aye. Mr. Clark? Aye. Ms. Larratt? Aye. Ms. Lofthouse? Aye. Mr. Reed? Aye. Mr. Hooley? Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. Right, thank you. That brings us to item 11, discussion action. Uh, item A, approve contractor for lease lease back contract and adopt resolution number 02012420, approving construction agreements with Roblin C Contracting Inc. Cordova High School fencing project. Dr. Kligi? Yes, at the December 14th meeting, um, the board tabled the above item to a future meeting and directed our staff to do a couple of things, to have additional conversation with our district safety advisory committee um, regarding the fencing and then to provide renderings and explore uh, measures to reduce cost and to also have the conversation with our student advisory board to see any questions or concerns they may have. Um, and that those, um, Additional steps have been taken in uh, the first part of January. Safety committee met on January 11th. Um, staff worked with a contractor to evaluate possible cost savings. The items identified could provide a potential savings on the total cost of about 200,000. And staff is recommending Robin con contracting to be the contractor for the fence project. Any questions, questions from the board? Uh, um, Mr. President? Yes, Ms. Reed. Yeah, um, it looks like we're still talking about eight foot fencing uh, in the front of the property. Is that correct? You want to come on it? We have a presentation with this too that might be helpful. Oh, yeah. Well, let's do yeah. the presentation yeah. first. Yeah. Because I think renderings were something the board requested at the last meeting as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, as Dr. Kligian mentioned, uh, we brought this back. We uh, went to the student advisory board. We presented it to them. We met at Cordova High staff. We had safety committee meetings. We had a safety committee meeting at Cordova High and met again to go through. We talked about the safety and security measures. Um, and with that, uh, we have a, a presentation we want to go through. We want to talk about some of the safety and security perspective. Um, DT Martin will be going through that. We also have a campus perspective from staff, which um, uh, Amy Strawn will be talking about. And then we'll go into about the aesthetics and the, the cost potential. With that, I'll turn it over to DT. <clears throat> Thank you. <coughs> Good evening, uh, board members. President, Dr. Kligian. Um Before I, I kind of get into the the, the, the why, you know, when we're talking about fencing, um, I probably should uh, just go a little bit into, you know, my own personal background, um, having worked in the field of security, safety, you know, for a number of years and 30 plus years and having uh, actually been in an environment where, you know, fencing, school fencing has, uh, you know, been needed. Um, Looking at our campuses, you know, here in the uh, Folsom Cordova School District area, you know, it is important that, you know, our fencing and why we put up fencing, you know, has to be for the right reason. I'm, I'm fully aware of that. Um, some of the things that we look at is the physical barriers, you know, restricting uh, unauthorized access. Uh, most of our campuses or some of our campuses have access from 360 degrees. Um, they're positioned near parks, um, open fields. So, you know, you have, uh, individuals who come and actually, you know, come through the campus on a regular basis. You know, and it's uh, something that I know the schools struggle with sometimes, you know, without, even with their staff. Uh, another reason I think why we should include fencing and considering these fencings is the, uh, the vandalism, and the criminal activity that occurs on our campuses. Um, we watched the 
video sometimes of our campuses at night that you know are not fenced and even during the day when some are fenced and we again see you know activity that is potentially dangerous you know to our students staff on on the campus um Student protection is, is, a, is a great deal of what we're trying to do. It's not to, um, you know, restrict anyone's uh, movements within the campus, but it does. it is necessary, you know, especially during school hours to funnel people into the campus through one area or a controlled area so that we know who is on campus. And again, with all our campuses being so open, some of them, we, we, people come on our campus all the time, but we don't know. We don't have a, a clue who's there and, and when they're there until something occurs. Um, another reason why, you know, the prevention of bullying, harassment, you know, and this is from outside, you know, individuals coming onto the campus. Um, I know at some of our uh, school events, especially at the high school level, when there's a um, rallies of some sort, you know, they get students from, you know, from the area to come onto the campus who want to attend that rally as well. So they have to be vigilant on, you know, recognizing and knowing, you know, who is and who is not, you know, on their campus. So fencing would uh, assist with that. Um, let me go to the... You know, some of the other things that, have, that we've dealt with just this year. Uh, we've had over 89 calls for SROs to the Cordova High School campus in uh, 2023. Uh, so far this year, we've had 95 calls. And that's what we're talking about is Cordova High School. You know, some of these incidents even involve, you know, folks coming on the campus bringing replica, you know, firearms, but all the same, they still uh, require the same response, you know, from law enforcement, from our student staff, going into the lockdown. And then that's happened again a couple of times. We look at the uh, number of uh, employees involved in fights on campus. And I'm talking about fights where individuals that are non-students, adults, as well come onto the campus that they're dealing with. And again, a fence probably would have uh, assisted in uh, maybe reducing some of these because it would have, uh, again, had that control interest to the campus and egress. Um, we talked about the uh, staff members uh, just, you know, this month or January, you know, we've had three staff members' cars that were broken into during the uh, school hours. Uh, two of those would have been behind the fence, you know, had the uh, fence been erected at, by that time. Um, the reduction of vandalism, of course, you know, it would, I think, is a deterrent. If people see that fence up, even in the evening hours or at night, because uh, we've had the uh, vandalism up until, I think, last week, you know, again, and we spent thousands of dollars in labor, you know, material, cleaning up the uh, vandalism, you know, just at Cordova High School alone. Um, campus perspective, I'm going to let uh, the principal talk about that. But the fact that, again, having worked in this field outside of uh, Fosso Cordova School District and having worked where fencing has been erected and where there's not, I, I know that calls for service from law enforcement is greatly reduced when there's a fence, when there's control access to the uh, campus. Uh, I believe that with uh, fencing as well, you get an environment where students feel like, you know, this is kind of defined, this is our area, this is our home, this is our campus, you know, and they can feel like this is a place that they can come and learn because that's ultimately our goal is for our students to learn in the environment that they feel safe in. Right, hi, thanks for having us tonight. Um, I wanna share a little bit and paint a picture of what happens at Cordova High on a daily basis. Um, that's where I start my day, that's where I end my day. It's home and it's where over 200 people start and end their day that work here. Um, Panya, if you haven't met him, is a hero at Cordova High. He opens the campus. He's the first one on site. He's our head custodian. Every day by himself, he has to usher unhoused individuals off our campus. Every day he's scanning every building, making sure that there's no litter, bottles, um, paraphernalia, um, vandalism. He started this week on Monday spending four plus hours and thousands of dollars of paint painting over vandalism 
that could have been prevented if we had had events over the weekend. And we run and we really work hard to get all of that vandalism covered before students come on campus. But he does that on a daily basis. We have um, the rainbow stairs have been vandalized multiple times. If you come on campus, you'll see images painted over because we've painted over areas. And those um, should be a safe haven for our students. And um, that was one of the first things of vandalism I dealt with when I came in September. And that's just not okay. When it comes to supervision, we have rally days. We have a beautiful amphitheater. It's beautiful. How do we make sure kids stay on campus? Sometimes the staff have to go, well, I don't know where they're going because we can't monitor the in and out of our campus. Lunches are really problematic and difficult because our campus is so large. That's a great thing. It's also a challenge at times. Before and after school, we try our best with the staff we have to make sure that every part of our campus is covered, but we just can't because of environmental challenges. The Cordova High staff has been phenomenal in addressing our discipline and using alternatives to traditional discipline, using restorative practices. We have seen this year alone a 52.89 decrease in suspensions off campus, 52.89. And yet despite that, 501, which is caused, attempted to cause threatened physical injury, remains the highest number of incidents. At least three incidents this year involved unauthorized persons coming on campus. One of those was the day after that last board meeting where you guys discussed this. The day after where we were talking about fencing and who should come on campus and who shouldn't, we had an unauthorized person come on for a fight. Our staff show up daily and they deserve to have a place where they feel safe, as do our students. We have Lancers that have been there for 20 plus years. And they're not going anywhere. But they also come in, drive in and go, oh my goodness, I hope nothing happens to my car today. I hope nothing happens and I have to break up a fight and get hit. And that's a real fear. And so what we did was we surveyed our staff and we, re we re received in only two days over 100 responses from staff. It is the highest participation I think I've ever seen from a staff survey, the highest. And here's what they said. When we asked, do you support the construction of a fence? These are staff, these are our, our folks, our Folsom Cordova team. 87% said they want a fence. When we asked, do you prefer six feet or eight feet? And I gave him a picture, what does it look like? 82% want eight feet. At this time, I feel like we have to look at the numbers, we have to look at our student experiences, and we have to listen to our staff. We love Cordova High. We absolutely think it's a beautiful campus. We want everyone to come and feel safe because that's the first thing that we need to do to get them to, to learn. Let's talk about what it looks like in the aesthetics. Thank you. So we did a lot of work. We looked at the aesthetics. We looked at the different types of fencing. Um, ornamental iron is used in the front of the school. It's more aesthetically pleasing. It's also harder to climb. Um, it's highly visible areas. Um, we were very careful to try to put it between buildings as much as possible for aesthetic reasons as well as for uh, cost savings. Um, we have that at the front and around the perimeter. Uh, typically the uh, chain link fence is used for in that area and we have that around the perimeter of the, of the campus. For comparison, uh, actually Mills has eight foot fencing, ornamental iron and Mitchell on the front, uh, as you see along Zinfandel also has eight foot fencing. Um, Cordova High or Folsom High is part of their um, future project. They have also requested eight foot fencing, not in discussion with Cordova, that was on their own. They had uh, highly um, want eight foot fencing as well. Just showing you some examples. This is the eight foot fencing at Mills that has been in place for quite a few years. Um, I, I believe it's been highly effective. Um, we don't have quite, I don't think the issues at Mills with the uh, vandalism and with graffiti and the, the like. Uh, there's some more examples of it, trying to you know, go between the buildings so it's not out front. Mitchell, you can see along Zinfandel, eight foot fencing along Zinfandel. Another shot there. I know it's not completely fenced in, but that section of it is. Then we looked at some neighboring districts, other examples of ornamental iron. Um, some districts don't even go between buildings as much. We they more on the perimeter. So, you know, we're very cognizant of trying to do that. This is something in Elk Grove. Uh, this is a one in Natomas Unified Intercom. 
and other um, uh, schools in San Juan School District. So just kind of give me an example how it can look. It's been um, aesthetically pleasing, I think, especially the way it's designed. This is a black ornamental iron. It fits in nicely with the school, kind of goes with the uh, red and black colors. This is just the, the plan. I know it's hard to read. It has been presented before. It's been approved by the site. We do have gates, electronic gates on Lancer Lane and as well as uh, between Mitchell, or uh, excuse me, Mills and the campus, those electronic gates we have there. We also have electronic door locks for the front insert. So when people come into the front, uh, they will be buzzed in. So it's a complete uh, safety surveillance and security. These are some renderings. Obviously this isn't installed um, of the, what it would could potentially, what it would look like. As you can see in the front entrance coming in, you have direct access to the front door, which is locked and had to be buzzed in. But there is fencing um, around the buildings as much as we can go between buildings. As you can see right here, this is going up. And so you have uh, access to the, uh, to the front so people can be buzzed in. Uh, you can see here, this is where the uh, counseling office is. The right to the right of that, or um, to the mill side, is the, where the sliding gate is and that will be locked or closed at all time and people would have to have uh, access either through a license plate reader or other access to get in for that. Uh, another view, as you can see, it's going between the buildings as you go down uh, towards the uh, B wing area. It's, uh, it's between buildings and as we go down towards the, uh, the theater, uh, it also goes between the buildings there. So it's not out front, it's between buildings. Here you can uh, see it coming up. I believe that's uh, C-Wing coming up from C-Wing. Um, you can see how it looks there. I think it's, you know, it, it fits in with the campus. It's not out front. It's not obtrusive. So we also looked at cost savings as much as possible. Um, this is a contract that we have. We would have to approve for this, for this amount, but we have worked with the contractor on some potential savings. And we think we can... Um, get cost savings, we're pretty confident we can get about $200,000 in, in savings. Some of the things we're looking at is going to a pre-galvanized fence material, uh, sleeving some of the existing chain link fence post, uh, moving some of the fence uh, in the buildings into the sidewalks, resulting in, in landscape irrigation repairs and installation of additional mow strips. And we have a, a, a contingency in here we think is not going to be necessary. It's not like a a building where you're going into it and you don't know if you have dry rot, you don't know unknown conditions. It's pretty much a known condition of what we're facing. So we think we can also reduce the contingencies. Some of the fears, if we uh, severely uh, redesign it or if we change it considerably, we would have to reject the bid and we'd have to go out to bid again. Um, we bid this during a time period when the bid climate was good Going into the winter, people are looking for spring work. Um, rebidding it now, we would be approaching summer, uh, which we have cost escalation just from the time we bid it. We may have less interest in it. Contractors are busier, and there's no guarantee, even if we reduce the scope that we'd come in, we could reduce scope and actually could come in higher. So there's no guarantee on that as all. Well. So that, that is one of the fears we have. So just kind of summarize, we went to the why, the physical, emotional, safety, and security. We covered the need for the fence. You heard the campus perspective. We also met with the student advisory board. I know Van is in here tonight, but he was also going to comment on that. He actually attended the safety committee meeting and the board meeting. Um, interesting comment from one of the student uh, was that is eight feet even high enough. So we thought that was an interesting comment. Um, ornamental iron in the front of the campus installed and then chain link at the perimeter. And our costs were hoping to save up to a, if not more, $200,000 in possible cost reductions. And with that, we have the, the recommendation, the rationale recommending moving forward with the contract. Thank you, Mr. Washburn. I'll bring it over to the board for questions. Um, I just had a really quick question. Um, is the fence gonna go in front of the counseling office? Because I know we've had problems with people walking into that. So will it will that be enclosed and then you'll get to the counseling office from the main area? Yeah, so the, the, the one side of the counselor, if the students come, that'll be enclosed in, so that's enclosed for the students, and then where the public could come in, that will be open for just the public to come into that area. Okay, perfect. So, and then just as a comment, so intercom on the front side looks really beautiful, but on their back side, they have like a 10 foot with a razor wire. So I feel like what we're getting, you, you know, we don't want to be chain link razor wire is not what we're, you know, 
wanting to do. So I, I'm very happy with the aesthetic of that. I appreciate you guys going back and at, look, at least looking at some cost reductions for us. Uh, Mr. President. Mr. Clark. Uh, yeah, Matt, great presentation. I love the renderings. Um, page 18 by the counseling office in the sliding gate, you mentioned something about uh, license plate recognition. Yeah, we can do programming. My understanding of the system is that uh, like staff and all that, they, they come in, they would they could program so they could uh, license plate that we could open them up for regular staff coming in and you know regular vehicles that have access. And that could be controlled any time programs. You, so you could immediately take somebody off if they're not approved. Okay, I'm just wondering what would be more cost effective, that or their ID making it a key fob? And there's also key card option, I believe. The thing with key card is you can also give your key card to somebody else. Um, and if you have a different vehicle, it was registered, you probably would have to have a key card. So those are some of the, the things we have to work out, but I believe there's a key card option as well. Um, if somebody loses their key card, then you would de deactivate that, give them a new one, or you know, so many. So um, I think it's it's both both options. Okay, and uh, Amy, I did have a question for you. I know a couple of years back, I actually took a tour in the back by the stadium, and it was open, and so I decided to walk. And it was early in the morning, one of my early morning walks, and um, we have some homeless folks sleeping back there. Is that still a problem? It's, it, it depends, I mean, it changes, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it, things are fluid. So every day, Panya's looking around. I know that there were some concerns, especially over breaks, in terms of using our facilities and, and um, things like Wi-Fi and outlets and, and things like that. And it's not necessarily that we want to be inhumane, but we right. also, my concern is, I want Panya to be, to be, to be working on the things that we need. Right, it's it's a matter of what can we control, what can we uh, monitor, and he is spending a lot of his time and our precious resource of Panya cleaning up things like that. Well, I think, and this was probably years ago, um, we did have homeless folks not only on Cordova but uh, Cordova Lane, uh, White Rock, Ranch Cordova Elementary that we're using you know, charging their phones, using the Wi-Fi, but I think we pretty much uh, fixed that uh, part. I was just kind of concerned about, like, Cordova and the stadium part because, I mean, even a football field, cigarette butts, bottles, and all that, and I'm just wondering if, if that has changed or do we still have that problem from time to time? No, we, st we still do. Okay. Um, and I, and I, I mean, coming from Mitchell, we still have that problem too. We have right. certain shelter areas um, that Ryan, the head custodian there, is cleaning up as well. Okay. And just to address that, Mr. Clark, we sure. still have several of our campuses that uh, we have the uh, unhoused coming to uh, visit. I mean, starting at 5 p.m., 6 o'clock at night, and, you know, they set up camp. About, uh, you know, 6, 7 o'clock, I mean, 5, 6 o'clock in the morning. And we're working with uh, the uh, local police department you know, to make sure that we can get them. They're starting fires sometimes in the uh, on the campus. Uh, they're using some of the structures from the playground as, uh, you know, as um, sheds, you know, building tents, mm -hmm. you know, so we, we still have that problem. And, and we have that within our CTE path. Like, so in this picture right here that you see, you can see the D wing, right? Right. And so that's where a lot of our construction um, sheds are that our students are building. And over one of our weekends that was broken into um, and student materials taken that we're now replacing. So, um, And are we working with um, Ranch Cordova PD to do periodic drive-bys? Yeah, yeah, yes, sir, we, you are. And uh, we, we in contact with the uh, night shift uh, watch commander, mm -hmm. you know, and they have been, you know, pushing folks out, you know, two or three o'clock in the morning. They actually have to get out of the car and walk around to the back of the campus, but you know, they, they've been doing, you know, as much as they can. Good. Okay, great, thank you. I have a couple more questions. Yeah, Ms. Lair. Um, Do we anticipate that this fencing will help solve some of the issues that we do actually have in the stadium area? Because I know that a lot of our vandalism actually happens in that. So are we anticipating that this on the front side is gonna help with everything on the back side since the fence doesn't go all the way around that area? I missed the first part of that, ma'am. Do, do we anticipate that this fencing is gonna help with some of the issues that we have in the stadium area specifically with vandalism? I think so, and, and the reason I say that is because if someone sees that the uh, campus is, is 
you know, front or fenced off in the front. And they would often come through the, uh, that back entrance next to the park and then come through the, onto the campus. But now because they can't access the campus at all. It's fenced off. It'll be fenced yeah, it'll be fenced off. So they, they, I'm hoping that with the tour folks from uh, even coming in because now they still, they can't just walk through. Right, right, right. Perfect. And then last question, actually, just thank you for this slide. Um, on this rolling gate that we have right here, um, does this have the capability to be able to be left open for like community events? So when you have like softball yes. tournaments and different things like that, that we can use that for parking area? It, it can be programmed. Yes, ma'am. Cool. Ms. Reed. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to preface my questions with uh, a statement, uh, which is uh, I've been uh, asking for this fencing for probably two years now and, and encouraging its expedition or expediency in getting this done as quickly as possible. Um, uh, so I don't want anybody to interpret any of my questions I'm about to ask as that I'm anti-fencing. So my first question, will the fence gates be unlocked on weekends, after school, and during vacations? I think what we'd have to look at is who's accessing the, the campus, you know, during those hours, and it it be, continues to be a problem that we're having now. Then the recommendation may be to not leave the uh, campus uh, wide open. And on Amy, what's you, what's your on that? So, I mean, we have a very busy schedule, right? Like right. high high schools, there's something going on all the time. Um, and so to me, it's a matter of really getting our systems in place of who's monitoring facilities. We have a phenomenal new assistant principal, Cody Owens, who's doing a really good job with organizing. I talked to Matt Compton again um, this week about the PAC, for example. We have renters um, that go into the PAC on a regular basis. And so we talked about what's going to be the protocol there. Um, I, anytime we just start opening all the time, that concerns me. So to me, it's a matter of really working with the team at Cordova and looking at what are the systems and protocols that we're going to put in place to ensure those who need the access and have the right to the access have it, but also making sure that those on campus on nights, weekends, some of those more vulnerable times are also very safe. Um, are you aware that uh, both of those explanations or answers uh, violate board policy? We have a board policy that says that all of our facilities will be open um, after school, on the weekends, and during vacation for the use of the public because it is a public facility. The gates can be locked after dark if that's the decision on the campus. Are you aware of that policy? I am aware of that policy, but as I understood the policy, it says that if that could change based on the activity on the campus, and I interpret that as, you know, there's crime, is there problems that are occurring on campus that occurring in the after hours or weekends that, you know, vandalism, crime, then, you know, we can have the option of uh, locking those gates. So you're going to lock the gates before you determine whether uh, leaving them unlocked will, will solve no, the problem? I, I, I think what we're saying is that, you know, we would have to look to see what happens in the evening hours. And if we are experiencing those uh, crimes, those things that have happened, then that we would have to reconsider whether we're going to leave the gates open or not. Um, Matt, how tall is the fence at Oak Chan Elementary? Six feet. Six feet? Yeah. Um, and is Oak Chan completely fenced in? Yes. And can you list uh, one of the, some of the, the extent of the damage that occurred at Oak Chan with a completely fenced in and locked uh, facility in the terms of vandalism? Well, it, it reduced it considerably after it was fenced in because we had a lot did of it prevent it? Well, it reduced it considerably after it was fenced in. We but had a lot it, of vandalism. Did it prevent it, though? I, it reduced it. I mean, I, I can't say what reduced it. It just, it reduced it after that. So we have to point that that probably is a, a big reason why. Well, if that's Oak, what you're asking. Well, no, I mean, we all know that Oak Chan, the worst graffiti it was ever done on that campus occurred after the fence went up, went up and the gates were locked. Right. I just saying it was reduced after I had talked with the principal after that and it reduced considerably the amount of ongoing graffiti and vandalism. Not to say that it uh, one of the worst occurrences happened after, right. but, on, but an ongoing basis, it, ha it has helped. Um, will fencing stop vandalism? Stop? 
stop? I don't think you can, you know, completely say anything's going to stop or start or prevent or I think at this time it's a matter of what are some of the things that we know we can put as as something that we can help, you know, um, minimize. And I think that that's something that the staff is wanting, students are wanting, and I think we need to explore that and really listen to their voices. Will fencing stop someone from bringing a firearm on campus? No, sir, it will not. Okay. Will fencing stop uh, fights from occurring on campus? No, sir. All right. Um, well, I mean, your presentation indicated that it was going to. But but... Can, I, can I interject? I think what it will do with fights yeah. is it will not allow friends, neighbors, other unauthorized folks coming onto our campus. And that is the largest fear of our staff. What okay. happened at Cordova High in years prior, what has happened before is not student fights necessarily. It is. A, it is a fear. I'm not going to minimize that. But what is more concerning are people that we don't know coming on our campus and while I don't think this is going to solve every case of that, it is it is a deterrent. It's a barrier. It's something we can put in place because if someone's trying to go over a fence, our CSOs are going to see that, right? A lot easier than someone slipping in over by the park. Um, and that's the fear. Oh, and I agree 100% with you on that. Um, so And keeping them from going out, yes. <laughs> so at the last board meeting, we asked you to price out six-foot fence in the front of the campus. Uh, how much was that going to save? It was very minimal, between about five and ten thousand dollars. To reduce two feet of fencing, it was going to yes. save ten thousand dollars. Yeah, I, and that was on the high side, uh, primarily because you're still doing the same amount of labor, same amount of material. I mean, it's just a little bit of savings on material. Okay. Um, do you consider Sutter Middle School an unsafe school? Are you asking anybody? Unsafe, I, I don't know, so to be an unsafe school, no, sir. So the four-foot fencing that's in front of uh, the ornamental fencing that's in front of uh, Sutter Middle School uh, along the corner of uh, East Bidwell and Riley is not serving uh, any, any, any purpose or... I mean, do we see students? Let me ask a different question. Do we see students climbing that fence to get onto campus at Sutter Middle School? Four foot fence. I, I don't, I'm not aware of any that, that occurring. And that might be a, a question for the uh, staff at Sutter Middle. But the, has anybody heard of that being an issue at Sutter Middle? To be honest, I'm I'm dedicated to my own site, and yeah. that's what I'm. <laughs> Right. Most concerned about. And, and if I can interject, I think we have to look at each school and each community um, individually. Even though we have 36 school sites in our district, you know, for different reasons, we consider different safety measures. We have standard safety measures, and our safety committee has put together criteria for having to advance some of those measures if that criteria is met. And a lot of thought has gone into that, and a lot of community voice and student voice and staff voice has been part of this process. So, you know, I don't think we can say every school needs a cookie cutter, six foot fence or eight foot fence or four foot fence. I think we have to look at what the environment and the needs are at that school. That's being responsive to what the safety needs are within that community. So I guess my question is, what does it say that we install eight foot, 10 foot fences in Rancho Cordova and we don't install the same fences in the city of Folsom. Are we uh, adding to um, perceptions uh, or even, you know, perhaps discrimination between the two communities that says that, well, if you're in Folsom, a four foot, five foot fence for the purposes of, of guiding traffic is, is perfectly acceptable. Mr. Reed, but if you're in the, could I interject about that? Um, I think that it would be discriminatory if we don't construct eight-foot fencing or the necessary fencing at Rancho Cordova because that's being disruptive to students' education, and that's a discrimination in my opinion. But um, that's just how I feel. But Right, and, and I, as I have indicated at the start of my comment, I have been pushing the school district for, for two years to get this fencing in, and I'm upset that it hasn't been put in to date. Um, my 
concern, and I'm I'm 100% supportive of eight foot fence or 10 foot fence along the sides of the school, behind the school, but in the front of the school where it's visible from the road, I feel that that is creating in a, a prison-like institutional environment for that campus, and there's no reason for it. Um, there's absolutely no reason for it because it's the, it's the front of the school, it's for directional purposes, no one's going to be scaling an eight or a six foot fence to get uh, to, to avoid entrances at, in the front of the school. Um, our board policy in the case that the, these campuses are supposed to be open after school on the weekends uh, and during vacations. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm concerned that cost aside, that we are, are creating an atmosphere that is not conducive to education when we know that a six foot fence or even a four foot fence serves the purpose of directing traffic. And I'm not suggesting a four foot fence here. I just think the eight foot fence and the examples you show made every single one of those school sites look institutional and could be uh, the same type of fencing you would find uh, in some type of correctional facility. And that I have a problem with. I don't think the students in Rancho Cordova need to be treated like that. It's a school, it's a public facility, it's not a prison. And if I can offer a response to that from the school site, those three incidents where we had someone come onto our campus unauthorized were in that parking lot, which is in the front of the school and in the administrative parking lot. So. I, I, I hear you in terms of directing traffic, but that is where they came in on our campus. And they came all the way into the quad before we were able to intervene. And they did do harm to our students. Oh, I agree. So but there's my, no, there's my concern, no fence though, there is right that now. in the front of the school is also that opening, right? And yeah. so that is an area. When we showed, I mean, this went pub, you know, public, and many of our staff, I think, are here. And they looked at this and said, actually, it looks really nice. Like, this looks nice. Black is our color. We are black and red. Those are our school colors. Um, and I think the way it's been designed to not be in front of the school, like maybe some of the other examples of neighboring districts, they're really looking at the buildings. I think that is the best to really ensure that sense of safety for well, our I students. I agree. And the reason why it was done that way is because I requested that to be done that way. Thank you. You're welcome. My point, though, is I, I'm really concerned about this, this mentality that fencing prevents problems. It doesn't, it helps with problems. It doesn't stop problems. It is not a cure-all. We need to stop, I mean, for that matter, why don't you put a 30-foot fence up? I mean, it, 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 we all know it doesn't prevent people from crossing our borders with a 30-foot fence. It doesn't matter how tall the fence is. Mr. Reed, uh, we'll come back for discussion as well. I just want to see if there's other questions from the sure. board. Um, I was just going to say, I think that this is a situation of what can we control and what can we not control? We clearly cannot control everything to stop, um, but we can control by putting safety guards for our students, for our staff, and listening to what they feel like their needs are. We are not on Cordova High School every single day, um, and I would venture to say that the people that are on Cordova High School campus every single day, working, learning, um, they probably have a much better idea of what is going to help prevent as much as we can and control as much as we can. And so, no, we cannot control people coming on campus armed. No, we cannot control people coming on campus and starting fights. Uh, but if there's anything we can do to help that and help control what we can, then I think that that's what we need to do. Ms. Larry. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that trying to compare site to site is probably a dangerous thing to be on. Um, one thing about Cordova schools, I think that it's a little bit different from Folsom, probably not every site, but most Rancho Cordova schools are contiguous with the park. And with Cordova, we're compounded by not only do we have a park, but we have a river that is wide open and, and everything like that. This fence that's right here in the front, this specifically is going to take care of the issue of the DoorDash drivers that come on the backside and rolling on the backside of the campus. And so we have people who are literally just coming on a campus willy nilly. I mean, honestly, it's like even with the six foot fence, I've seen them, the kids be up and over the six foot fence in two seconds. So, I mean, as much as I would love to save the cost, if we're not really talking that this is a lot of cost savings for us to go from a six foot to an eight foot, um, 
I've been on Mitchell's campus a million times and we've been on, we've all been on Mills campus many times. And I don't feel like the eighth offense is an institutionalized feeling. I don't think our students will because we're talking about acres and acres and acres. They're probably not even gonna really get near the fence a majority of their day. They're probably not even gonna be anywhere near that. Um, and also just from where the cafeteria is in conjunction with the park is an issue because where they come out from the cafeteria, if you decide to leave campus, you're through Dan Lancer Lane and into that parking lot or into the park before anyone would even notice that you were gone. So, I mean, unfortunately, I think we're just <laughs> in a situation where I think to compare Folsom and Ranch Cordova is probably not really fair because you're not talking that the conditions are the same. So if you're talking about Sutter, what's around Sutter? Like nothing, like there is nothing that's really touching it except for maybe a little bit on the back side of things. So I just don't think that trying to compare the two sites is probably. Well, and we're also talking elementary schools and middle schools versus a high school. So there's also a huge difference in the size of the students we're talking about as well. So, um, or potential people coming onto the campus. So I want to take out to public comment unless we have other questions from the board and then we'll come back for the I had one more question. Yeah, Smith. Ms. Miller. Um, back on slide uh, 14, there was um, some examples from SJU San Juan Unified and it did mention video monitoring systems included with this fencing. Is that a plan we have or is this infrastructure already on Cordova High? We have video talking about video cameras yeah yes yes we have a lot of video cameras all our sites now have video cameras and uh quite extensive uh you know dt and we looked around on the sites to make sure the locations of uh, where the cameras could be to make sure we get the most activity great thank you okay let me take it out to the public and then we'll come back to the board for our final comments uh first speaker is jp dolliver JP will be followed by Gold Con. Welcome. Thank you guys, appreciate it. Um, so I'm the head football coach and athletic director at Cordova High School. I've been there about a year now. Um, I would say out of all the things that uh, the time that I spent at, at Cordova right now, um, the, the security of the students is my biggest concern. Um, their, not just their physical uh, well-being, but also their mental well-being, is, um, I think is something we always have to take into consideration. But the educational experience is the one thing that I think takes the biggest hit when we're focused on that. Um, you know, and a lot of the stuff you guys are talking about, you know, you guys have done a ton of research. A lot of my stuff is, you know, anecdotal evidence, that stuff that I've experienced at my time at Cordova over the past year. But I've seen in my time over there, um, you know, some disturbing things, fights. Um, I've seen staff members who have been there at a long time. I've seen a coach get, um, you know, punched. A guy that coached me at Sierra College back in the day a long time ago that's, uh, you know, um, in my opinion, a future Hall of Famer over there. Um, so there is some, there are some disturbing things that have happened over that time. And, um, and it's broken. Right now the security at Cordova is broken. It, it could be fixed but it's broken. And you guys have been talking about it for a long time. Uh, the time's now to start doing something about it. In my opinion, I would have an officer there all day long, um, you know, with a firearm at their hand. And, you know, and I would say no, uh, no cell phones out. We have a professional dress code and we have a fence that circulates that or encompasses the whole school. I know I'm not going to get that stuff. I know that's, uh, oh, you know, kind of an old school thought, but I think a secure, border is a start you know and i think they probably f find the same idea at christian brothers when it's got a 10 to 12 foot you know fence line that circles you know their campus right off mlk and oak park they're realistic um last time i was at jesuit i got escorted out by the security after seven on seven they said see you later lock the gate right behind me um and my time at el camino the school i was at before which is very um similar uh, to Cordova, um, it's a closed campus. Um, the time that my first experience was at Sac High. Sac High has a fence around. Uh, the kids loved Josh, who was a security guard. Uh, he was an ex-cop on campus. They loved him. Um, but my point is the kids felt secure at that campus, very secure. Um, so I, and I, and I agree, we wanna make sure our kids feel safe. We wanna make sure that 
These kids are, um, they go to school and have a great educational experience. They feel comfort, they feel love. I'm gonna read a quote, though I love this one. This is from the other day. Um, you know, discipline without compassion is cruelty, but compassion without discipline is chaos. We gotta make sure our kids are safe. We have a closed campus at Cordova. It is not co closed. That is a porous campus. Kids are going up and down Chase. They go down all the way. They're at Starbucks. They're at, you know, wherever they want to go. That thing's open. And unfortunately, you know, that's also means it's open for, for transits or people to come across. A DT spoke of it. You know, you got people coming, um, you know, from the river, from the lake. Um, and we don't know who these people are. We don't know them. Um, and, and I, you know, besides the vandalism and all the other things, I worry about the student safety with that when it comes to that. Um, you know, basically what I really want to just end with is, you know, we're, we're, we're there to protect the kids and also make sure that we guide them and providing them with some boundaries is that is guidance. Kids want boundaries. The first thing they do when they go into the classroom is ask, what are we doing today? We put objectives on the board. Kids want to know that. They want to know what kind of classroom they're walking into. And I think that's important so when they know that they are safe when they walk into our school as well. So um, I just, just in finishing, we need to raise the bar of expectations at Cordova. And it starts with the safety there. Thank you. Yeah. At Golcon. Good evening. My name is Gul Khan, and uh, I'm a resident of Folsom. And not only that, just a, a resident over there, I am uh, part of the Folsom High School's Light Safety Committee as well. I'm actually in favor of uh, having a fence on this one, but I also would like to actually see there are more things that can be done as well. Just like you mentioned earlier, David, that uh, we have, uh, we should not be making the schools just like a prison. There's a different, there should be a difference between the two. And I really love that one. At the same time, so we, what we can do is we can use some technology as well. We are also looking at the, the fencing right now, but in addition to the fencing, we also see there are issues that are beyond the boundary of our schools as well. Uh, one of the common issues that we have, and I have recently seen very close calls in some of the incidents where we, uh, the drivers are not actually following the the school zone speed limit. That has been an issue. So this requires, we cannot just put it everything on the, on the local police department and say that they need to do it. We need to actually have a comprehensive approach for that one, using the technology, using the uh, parent uh, and uh, volunteers, using a public-private partnership as well. So that's the main, uh, these are the main areas that we, we have to focus. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, next up is Nancy White, followed by Amy Wallace. Good evening. Um, I'm a teacher at Cordova High School. Um, this is my 10th year there. Uh, probably what I'm going to say is a little bit uh, rep repetitive um, based on what everyone else has already spoken about, um, but I thought it was important to give you my own perspective. Um, in the time that I've been there, there has been a car chase through our campus. Uh, the person that the police were chasing was familiar with the campus and thought there was still a shortcut um, through where the uh, new gym is now. Uh, when he found that he couldn't get through there, he drove between buildings and the police right after him. Um, in that time, there has been um, in our neighbor school mills, um, someone with a BB gun shooting squirrels during school hours. That I happened to witness myself because I was speaking to a student outside of my classroom door and he was, uh, the uh, campus monitor uh, was trying to uh, get him and the um, police were there um, on the loudspeaker telling him to stop running. Um, Ms. Um, Strong mentioned the vandalism of the, rain, of the rainbow steps. Um, she didn't mention, however, that there, they were vandalized, but there were hate messages there. Also, um, along the lines of the vandalism, um, uh, there are also often or have been messages that attack teachers. Um, in my own classroom and the restroom, 
that I use, which by the way needs to be better. <laughs> um, uh, the handles have been broken or uh, because someone has attempted to break into them. Um, as far as the unhoused people in the uh, amphitheater and the cafeterias, um, the custodians don't feel safe and um, they have reprimanded some of my coworkers for being on campus after dark because it isn't safe for them and it's not safe for others. Um, by the way, it's not just teachers that are at school after hours, um, it's our students and, uh, participating in activities, it's students waiting for their rides. Um, I'll get uh, to that a little bit further um, if I have time. Um, another thing that happened to me was that there was a parent who had a miscommunication at the office uh, regarding uh, lates and the buses and they were angry and they walked all the way up to my door as I was greeting students into my class and proceeded to cuss at me in front of them. Uh, thankfully, I was able to diffuse the situation and uh, calm the parent down, but that could have gone south very quickly and ended up in a different way. Um, she didn't just have access to me, but also to my students. I'll try to be quicker, I'm sorry. Um, my own experience with, um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna take, is that okay if I go a little bit longer? Thank you. Yes, please, go ahead. Um, I know that, I know the reluctance about having a fence. I grew up in um, East Los Angeles where all the schools are fenced. Um, I also uh, happened to move to a different community as a high school student my senior year. And I went to a very upscale private girls school, which also was fenced. Um, I can tell you that it's not, um, it's just like a house. The building itself doesn't make it a home. It's what happens inside, right? The family making uh, memories, um, creating safety, and our schools are the same. It's not the buildings. Um, it, yes, it won't be the fence. The fence isn't going to stop or prevent that, but it will certainly help um, in many ways. I think that all of the situations that I uh, detailed for you um, illustrate where a fence could have helped some of those situations. Um, they may have not happened at all. Um, as Ms. Strawn said, um, we love Cordova, we wanna be there. I, I'm here speaking now, even though it makes me very nervous and I'm a little scattered uh, because of that, because I care about my students, I care about my uh, friends and um, it, it is my family and it is my home away from home. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Wallace. So I have a unique build to Cordova. I'm a Cordova alumni. I've taught there for 22 years, and I have, and I'm a proud parent of two Cordova High students. Can you um, go to like the? Can we... What well, if you can just speak directly to us? Sorry. Oh, sorry. The um, like the picture of the counseling office, and then the classrooms. The one more. Like okay, so. My classroom happens to be the classroom that you're looking at right now. Every day at A and B lunch, I don't know how many students take leave of Cordova High School. That's a safety issue. If I send my kids to school, I think they're at school. They're leaving campus and then they're coming back on campus. I have served on the district safety committee and at the last meeting, we were talking about drugs and alcohol on campus, fencing, keeping our kids on campus where parents think they are, could alleviate some of that, them going off campus. We don't know what they're doing, right? So that could help keep those kids from going off campus and doing things that we don't want them doing during school hours. Um, this year I've had a student, I've had a, I had to, um, corral a student into my classroom around the way because a parent was coming up and over the cement after school, attack, going to attack her. Um, I think at that point, like the fence would have helped that and not had that parent going after one of our students. I don't think a six foot fence would help. I think that we need that eight foot fence just 
they're taller, they're bigger. Um, I And today I asked my study skills class, like, do you want offense? Do you want, not want offense? The reason for not offense was because he wants to go get his McDonald's at lunchtime. So, I mean, they're kids, right? But like, again, their parents think they're on our campus, not off of our campus. Um, also, the reason for the yes for offenses was because they wanted their friends to stop going down to Hagen Park and stay on campus with them. So I think the safety of it, keeping people off, and also keep the safety of keep keeping students on and educating them is why we need those fences and hopefully eight foot ones. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, we're going to take it online. It looks like there are no online comments. So we'll bring it back to the board for final comment and or uh, motion. I have a final comment. Yeah, Mr. Reed. Um, you know, again, I don't think there's a single board member who's not supportive of putting a fence around Cordova High. That's clear. Um, there's not a single board member up here who's not concerned about security. That's clear. What, um, and you know, I mean, obviously agree to disagree on the, the, whether a six or eight foot fence or, or the extra two feet is gonna accomplish anything other than potential appearance. But I, for whatever it's worth, I want to read another board policy that we have that applies. It has to be, it's, it's board policy. It's not discretionary. It's not an aspiration. It's a requirement because it's a board policy. And the board policy reads, the board recognizes that schools are an important community resource and encourages community members to, take, to make appropriate use of school facilities. School sites that contain outdoor recreational resources may be available to the public for use during non-school hours unless there is a history of vandalism that would necessitate locking gates during non-school hours or is otherwise provided within this policy. As used within this policy, the term outdoor recreational resources shall include but not limited to athletic fields, ball walls, basketball courts, open fields, picnic tables, playgrounds, and play structures. High school football stadium, tennis courts, and swimming pools are exempt from this policy and any unsupervised public access is hereby prohibited. Uh, fencing may be used at school sites as a way to direct public to specific points of access during school hours and to outdoor recreational resources. Fencing should be utilized in the least restrictive manner to achieve its purposes. Points of access to outdoor recreational resources may include gates with locking mechanisms provided that such gates shall be open in the or shall be in the open position during non-school hours unless an ex exception applies. The use of security cameras and coordinating with where gates might be placed would be considered beneficial when practical. Any school site that is adjacent to a city park shall have direct access as practical during non-school hours between the properties unless otherwise agreed <clears throat> Is unless otherwise, excuse me, unless agreed otherwise by the school board, city council, or local parks and recreational district. So that is our board policy. Um, and, uh, you know, I, my, my frustration, and it is a frustration, is every time we fence any school facility in anywhere in the district, even though we have this board policy, this is the most violated board policy we have. We have elementary schools that are in neighborhoods that have never had vandalism, that you go there on the weekend, it's locked up. These are the same schools that in the summertime used to have 40, 50 kids and parents enjoying the facilities. And now they don't even have access to it, even though these are taxpayer facilities. And I don't know how many times I have emailed 
and I apologize, Superintendent Kaligian, but I don't know how many times I've emailed the superintendent about this when I go in site by site checking whether the facilities are locked and I send email after email after email indicating that the facilities are locked. And sometimes there are students who are still in the facilities because they jump the gates, they jump the fence on the weekends. We are taking away a taxpayer facility that has playground equipment, that have ball walls, that have play, or, um, at, you know, asphalt uh, playgrounds, that have um, fields for kids can run around, play, and have fun. Um, and just simply because we have this obsession with putting fencing everywhere and not abiding by this policy. I have better things to do than drive around and checking gates at elementary schools on weekends and in the summertime to see if they're unlocked for the public to be able to have access to it. But 90% of the time they're locked. And then when I call and, and raise the issue, it might be unlocked for a week and then it's locked again. What's the point of having policies? What message are we saying to the public? It's the same thing as it goes in any law out there. These are not like suggestions. If we have this as a policy, we need to abide by our policies. I wouldn't even be probably making this a big deal tonight if it wasn't for the fact that this district constantly violates this board policy. And it's upsetting. So um, those are my final comments. And, and court, Coach uh, Doherty, I agree 100% with you. We are, um, are um, not Doherty, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> all the dirt. Um, uh, I agree 100% with you that we need a full-time uh, SRO with, uh, that, that is armed at each of our high schools, including Cordova High. I agree with you that we should have a cell phone policy that bans cell phones on all campuses, not just K through A. Um, so, I, and I'll go one step further. We're so concerned about fights on campuses, and one of the, the chief reasons why there are fights on campuses is clothing. We need a dress code, not throwing out the dress code, which we did. It's not a surprise that, that fights increased the year after we got rid of our dress code. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Reed, any other final comments? Uh, again, it's a discussion action item. So also uh, after comments and motion, if you so choose. Yeah, I have some comments. Ms. Larry. Um, you know, I think one thing to think about in the perspective of Cordova High School specifically is that really the areas that need to be accessed on the weekends would be, which is the area between Mills and Mitchell. That is not an area that's going to be fenced. Those are the fence, the, that area will be open. And really the areas that we're fencing in, there's really not a reason why you would be on there because we can't, you, you, I mean, I don't, I can't even get a key to the stadium. Like I can't even get a key to the stadium because it is so specific to the groups that use it. There is one key per, per group that gets, pushed out there and it's for security for security reasons. So my key is with a coach. Um, I'm not anticipating that, like I hope that the fencing brings down some of the vandalisms. That would be great. That would be a great byproduct of these fencing. But I think that what we're talking about here really is the safety and the security of what's happening. And, you know, I'm at the point where I'm like, if if we've got some of these issues that we maybe need to review this board policy about being so free and open with that. And while I, I agree, that specifically probably elementary schools, I'm just not really seeing why beyond field usage, why we have a lot of students that should be on those campuses. Like why would they be on interior campuses during the middle of a weekday? Like that doesn't seem like something that we need to be looking at. So if we need to go back and review this policy for this open, open closed situation, then maybe we need to do that and maybe put in a little more flexibility in it for, for this. And we're talking about specifically this site and we're talking about specifically the fact that we've had um, people who've <laughs> thrown bricks and rocks at opposing teams. Um, we're talking about vandalism on our brand new um, uh, seating for our soccer players, our, our shelters. That happened this week. We're talking about the fact that we've had the boneyard broken into and the a speaker system stolen out of a, of a trailer there. 
We're talking about the fact that they literally broke into the snack bar and destroyed thousands of dollars of worth of equipment in there. I mean, we couldn't even use a snack bar. You literally, it's, the framework is like bolted on there. You have to take like literally a, a uh, electric screwdriver to like pull everything off. It takes like an hour to get the freaking thing open. And then you have people who are wanting to use it. And for a portion of the season, there was no freezer, no refrigerator. There's no warmers because we have kids who go in there and vandalize it. I mean, we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. And I understand that this is taxpayer money, but now we're using taxpayer money to replace these things. And if the public cannot be responsible with using our sites, then we have to like evaluate if they're not gonna be responsible with the sites. That is a privilege. It is a privilege to use those things. And if, if we're going on there, I mean, we can't put an all weather track at Mills. We can't put an all weather track at Sutter because it's unfenced, it's open, they will destroy those tracks. And so we don't invest in those things because they aren't responsible enough to use them in the proper way. So it's like, I don't think that we can like, just number one, compare the sites. I don't think that it's institutionalizing the kids. I think it's giving guidance to them. And I think that we probably need to go back and review that policy then of how open we are with the usage of the sites. So that's my comments. I, I don't have any comment other than to say I, I uh, support this tonight. I'll plan on voting yes if we have a motion for it. So uh, is there a motion to approve? Uh, Move. My motion by Mr. I'll Reed. I'll second. Second by Mr. Clark, Superintendent. Mr. Mellator. Aye. Mr. Clark. Aye. Ms. Larratt. Aye. Ms. Lofthouse. Aye. Mr. Reed. Aye. Mr. Hui. Aye. Motion carries 5-0. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And thank you for, for your time uh, and the presentation. Uh, that brings us into uh, item 12 discussion. And uh, again, as we had approved this agenda, we are going to start with item B, district-wide transitional kindergarten TK program report. Yes, I'd like to invite Angie Carla Magno up to the podium. She's going to give us um, a, a brief presentation on where we're at with transitional kindergarten and what we're planning for uh, for this next school year, as well as options for Montessori and talking about the educational expo for our early learners. Welcome. Thank you. Um, good evening, Dr. Kligan, President Hui, board, my colleagues. Um, tonight, I am going to be giving an update on transitional kindergarten. So I wanna take a moment to thank the very important team behind the work. We meet twice a month to plan and problem solve all things related to TK here at District. And that core team is Matt Washburn, Jerry Wickham, Joanne Blysdale, Marie Pollock, Jackie Wise, Denise Earl, and Amy Peterson. I would also like to thank my CNI team for their help with the curricular components. All of these folks are committed team members and I am grateful for their hard work. I'd also like to take a moment to honor Amy Peterson, who is our TK ambassador. She is a current TK teacher in our district that is helping guide the work of this team. She's been an integral part of the development of our TK program, and I can't tell you the countless hours this woman has spent after school, in the evening, and um, at, during the school day. She has some release days as well to help with this program. It's a big lift, and I would like her to come up, and I have something to give her. Let's give her a round of applause. I told her she had to give the report, but she was very nervous and she refused. <laughs> so I would like to take um, a moment to talk about the why um, for this program. If we could go to the next slide. Thank you. So um, providing a high quality education for children before they turn five, year old um, is yield significant medium and long-term benefits for students. Children in early childhood education programs are less likely to repeat a grade and they're less likely to be identified as having special needs. Our TK program blends social and emotional experiences with academic learning so that students not only learn essential pre-literacy and numeracy skills, they also are learning cognitive skills as well but they also develop social 
and self-regulation skills needed to succeed in school and life. We like to say that TK is the bridge between preschool and kindergarten. Transitional kindergarten is a universally accessible and free program for age eligible four year old children. By 25, 26 school year, the TK will be available at no cost for all four year old children in the state of California. Now it's important to keep in mind that parents may choose to enroll their children in a TK program or any other pre-kindergarten program they choose. So they could choose to enroll in a preschool or stay with an in-home preschool or private preschool or TK options. Um, I'm proud of our vision and our mission. It really is the cornerstone of our programs here in FCUSD. Um, this statement, um, vision statement and mission statement were created with the teachers and uh, last year. So please note that we are committed to cultivating joy, imagination and inspiration in our program, along with play-based um, exploration and a culturally rich and equitable environment for all students. This slide makes me smile. There are some of our TK teachers on the left there. Uh, they are the heart of this program. They are a dedicated group of teachers and they have special credentialing that allows them to be um, a TK teacher. So they have early childhood education units as required by the state. Since our program currently requires a one to 12 ratio, we also have aides in our classrooms supporting our young learners. And I'm proud to report that we have a teacher residency program in our district. Thank you to our HR team and Dawn. And it's going fabulously. We have teacher residents serving as aides in some of the classes, and then they go to their um, course curriculum to become teachers in the evening. They're very dedicated to our programs. Um, once their credentialing is complete, our hope is that we are able to have them apply for open TK positions in the future. So TK is a part of the K-12 public school system and is the first year of a two-year kindergarten program that uses a modified kindergarten curriculum. So with that said, it's age and developmentally appropriate, and we have adopted by a company called Teacher Created Materials as our literacy curriculum. And we have Learning Without Tears handwriting program. We adopted those last year with input from our teachers. They did a pilot program and tried out the materials. And then we're currently working on math, curricula math curriculum. At our common planning time this Friday, um, our CNI team will be talking through some of the components of that. So we equip the, equip the classrooms with the needed materials and play equipment to run imaginative centers. And that is something that is so important so that teachers can maintain that play-based learning. Okay, let's talk TK places and spaces. In the blue and in the light red, we have the current Rancho TK sites and the current Folsom TK sites. <laughs> You'll see the number of classes and then an indication if it's an AM or a PM class. And then also, this is huge. We are one of the only districts um, doing this. We are a front runner in this area. We have concurrent enrollment with our California State Preschool Program. And I am extremely proud of this because we're able to offer a full day program to our families. So students that are involved um, in this, they go to preschool either in the morning or the afternoon. And on the opposite schedule, they go to TK, which is fabulous. And then we provide lunch in the middle. So when expanding TK, we look at a number of data points, including demographer data, live birth rates, census data, and geographical, geographical locations, and then classroom spaces and logistics. Grant funding for portables is extremely competitive. And with TK implementation statewide, it's hard to secure extra funding from the state. With that said, our facilities and maintenance departments are working tirelessly to make sure that we have space for TK in our district. We have purchased on our own dime because we did not qualify, we didn't get the grants there as it was quite competitive. Um, so we purchased and added portables to Cordova Villa and Theodore Judah. And we also have completed construction or are planning to do so at 
uh, to ensure various sites uh, restroom access and adequate space for our young learners. So next year we plan to open the other half of the standalone TKs. So it's important to note that because the classroom space is already reserved. So there's a group of 24 students, say in the morning or the afternoon, and then the teacher does intervention um, on the opposite schedule if there's not another class slated. If there is, if it's an AM, PM model, there are 48 total students being serviced um, within that day for the full day. In Folsom, I anticipate opening a PM class at Judah, Oak Chan and Goldridge. We planned for two classes at our newest elementary school, Alder Creek, and then Carl Sundahl was identified as they cover a region where there are not many TK options for parents. At this time, we are recommending keeping the Montessori program in the morning and adding TK students in the afternoon to the open spots. So considerations for the Montessori while expanding TK. Um, the proposal is to maintain the integrity of the Montessori program while introducing transitional kindergarten students into that afternoon session, utilizing available space. And it's important to note that there will be um, eight kindergarten students that are serviced for a full day, and then we would have 16 open spaces available for new TK students in the afternoon. So the AM session would remain the same with the current Montessori program serving three through five-year-olds in a traditional Montessori program with the current teacher and her preschool associate. And then, like I said earlier, um, the PM session would include those eight kindergarten students and we would hire a TK teacher and that would be um, the teacher of record in the afternoon to maintain our 12 to one ratio. So with that said, um, what's on the horizon for TK? We are finalizing a math curriculum adoption. We'll um, have construction to expand TK space um, beginning this spring at White Rock Elementary and this summer at Rancho Cordova Elementary. And then our first early learning expo, which I'm really excited about, is planned for this month. It will highlight every amazing program that FCUSD offers for our youngest learners. And it's um, going to be here in the boardroom one evening in February, and then also another evening in Rancho Cordova at the Cordova Lane Center. And we are planning lots of really fun booths that are gonna showcase our preschool, expanded learning, TK, school readiness, and health services will also be with us um, to connect parents to any services that they may need. So board, if you are available, we would love to have you stop by. Um, and that concludes my report and thank you. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Thank you so much. Uh, so I will bring it out to questions from the board. Um, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm excited to see what comes of um, the expanded TK. And I'm also grateful that you have looked into opportunities to kind of maintain programs that are wildly popular among our families. So thank you. Um, I am a firm believer in mixed modalities for education and think that while um, many different ways of doing things and exposing kids to all of the different ways to kind of get that love of learning. So thank you. You're welcome. I will also mention that we're going to be seeking um, a TK teacher. I got permission um, to hire after um, some of our processes in the district with staffing um, for a teacher. We'll be looking um, for someone who is interested in Montessori um, for the program so that it can blend together nicely. That was kind of my question is how the afternoon was going to go with having Montessori transitioning into traditional. Right. So is the goal to kind of get that teacher in there that kind of has that more Montessori feel to it? In the afternoon? I would love that. Yes. I think um, the, I believe the families would as well. Um, I know that they're here to speak tonight. Um, I've had the great pleasure to speak with um, the Montessori teacher, Miss Tara. We've um, spoken two times and with the um, preschool associate, Marissa, and I have had some communications with parents and I can tell you that this is a very well-loved program in our district. So my hope is to be able to blend 
together and service general education and um, our families with this special program. So a bit of a compromise. We have had um, registration at Carl Sundahl. They've been taking um, early applications and the principal reported to me today that we've had 13 families that are interested um, that have taken packets for general education TK. So my hope is to find someone that blends with the program and then we add a layer of numeracy and literacy um, that is um, complements what we are doing in TK. So I would like to modify that and make it work together. Uh, Mr. President, yeah. uh, thank you, Angie, for that uh, presentation. You're very welcome. Uh, clarification. Uh, so <clears throat> the PM session, you're going to have include a kindergarten um, and blend in 16. So 24 kids in that same classroom. Correct. So right now we have current AM PM models mm -hmm. where you'll have a teacher of record with 24 students and the other teacher serves as the co-teacher so that the ratio is 1 to 12. And then in the afternoon in the PM session, the same thing happens um, there. So then we also have aides time that is um, utilized when there's a break or during lunch to make sure that we have to absolutely maintain TK ratio of 1 to 12 so that we do not have any sanctions on our funding. Um, so that's super important. And then the Montessori right now as it currently stands, there's 24 students in the morning and then in the afternoon there's eight students that are full day kinder with the teacher. Okay, because I'm, I was there uh, and I'm trying to visualize how it was set up, and I, I, I don't know, is there enough room to, I mean, and the way that it's set up with the Montessori style of program, mm -hmm. would the TK students be able to adapt to that and adapt to that system, the, well, the Montessori system? Sure, I think that the morning students have, so I think that with um, being able to have access to um, those materials that the afternoon students would as well. Okay. Thank you for your question. Any questions, Ms. Reed? Yeah. Um, currently, the Montessori program is both AM and PM. It's offered, correct? It is, yes. Yes. Um, but it's just the kindergartners that stay all day because we offer full day kindergarten. Okay. Um, so the, the TK right now is, is, uh, just morning Montessori, is that right? Yes. The, the, so the morning class right now is three through five year old students and the five year olds then at the midpoint of the day go to lunch, the teacher goes to lunch and then they come back in the afternoon and the teacher serves the kindergarten students in the afternoon. Um, you know, obviously the Montessori program uh, has been very popular uh, at this site. I mean, presumably it could be popular elsewhere in the, in the, the, the district. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, what was the biggest impediment to keeping the program as it currently exists? Well, I would definitely say space. Um, I, the way I look at this is when we had half day kindergarten, um, we had at least two kindergartens um, at each site. And so I would imagine that we, I mean, Folsom Cordova offers quality programs. So I would imagine that um, when it's all said and done, when all of the age ranges are rolled out by 25, 26, and we offer to all four-year-olds, that will more than likely have about two one or two classes at each site that will be um, taken advantage of by parents. Was uh, any consideration made at um, adding a portable to the site in order to keep the Montessori program unchanged? Right, that's a really great question. You know, um, and I can't quote the um, exact numbers, but as I was saying earlier tonight, it was extremely competitive for the um, grants from the state for the portables. And I want to say that it was like a four to one ratio of um, money that was available to the number of requests. Like, you know, I know that the facilities department could give you more information on that. Um, but I do know that portables are costly. And so as we're looking at the program in long term, I mean, potentially that might be an option. I think we would have to 
work with our facilities department to see how that would play out over the years in our plan for expanding TK and the availability of funds within that department. So um, the district's not necessarily opposed to revisiting Montessori if there's space to um, return the program to uh, how it's currently. I wouldn't want to shut the door to anything. I think, you know, the best thing we could do is try something. And if it doesn't work, we could reevaluate that and come up with another plan. Um, you know, I'm hopeful that this would work because it would, um, for spacing, it would help with um, the site. Um, you know, we've had some other um, programs that have moved to our sites. And so there are other um, requests for space and for bathrooms and things of that nature. And so, um, you know, it's, it's all about as we plan this out, just being, you know, looking at what options we have and what means we have at that time to make those decisions. Has the district considered moving the Montessori program to a site that has empty classrooms that uh, would be allowed for the program to continue in mm -hmm. its current structure, such as at Sandra J. Gallardo or Goldridge, which both sites um, at one point, uh, well, at least Sandra J. Gallardo at one point had over 700 students and now has, uh, you know, I mean, I guess we just realigned the border slightly to help that situation mm -hmm. out, but, you know, say 450 students. Um, did you consider uh, that approach? You know, we did talk about that approach. Um, there's been, uh, like I said, some other programs um, that are being added to the campuses. So I would definitely have to check with facilities on that. Um, I did want to, the Montessori program was at Carl Sundahl, um, you know, it, to, it seems to me it is deeply ingrained within that community. Um, but certainly I wouldn't, like I said, close the door to any, you know, of these different types of options. Okay. Uh, those are the questions. I Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, it's great job. It, it feels Thank like we you. really, we have one discussion item, but it feels really like it's two. Uh, right. One is the, the TK, and I just want to commend you and your team it's a huge lift to add these programs to all of our schools. So um, really appreciate the work. And then Thank you, Mr. Huey. Of course, yeah, the, of course, then the second issue is related to it, but is the Montessori program and trying to figure out how we're gonna incorporate that into right. all that you're talking about. Um, so my, I mostly have Montessori questions as well. Um, but I also do wanna say, I, you know, I appreciate that you have the thought that's been put into this, trying to listen to, um, our parents and families that are part of this program that clearly it's it's working for right. them. Um, so let's start with um, make, just making sure I understand it. The, the proposal right now is that we would have the AM, which would include uh, the, the TK plus kindergarten. Plus three-year-olds, it would remain unchanged. Remain unchanged. And then the PM model, kindergartners would stay and we'd have another uh, PM group of TK Right. as well and we're we're hoping to find a teacher that is experienced in Montessori to come in and help with that part yes. of the day as well yes I would recommend having Miss Tara on the interview panel along with um, the principal and myself to find an adequate teacher that um, would blend with the program so that would be our hope yeah so it would it would like you've said it would blend it would remain uh, have some Montessori values but also bring in some uh, of general ed values mm -hmm. um, are we aware of Montessori programs that have done that blending? That's a good question. Um, you know, when this came to light, um, we started doing some research on other Montessori programs. So um, in that research, I will say no, I did not look deeply into that um, model yeah. at I other mean, places. I mean, I, I would say I'm not opposed to the model, but I guess the one thing I want to avoid is trying to take a little bit of each and then ending up with something that doesn't quite work for either. Right. Um, and I'm not sure how, how we would judge that. You had mentioned we'll keep an eye on, if, it, if yeah. this is working, we'll, right. let's go with it. Do, do you May have, I offer yeah. um, just an example of something that we tried this year? So we tried an afternoon uh, TK at Peter J. Shields and it was blended with a preschool program. So they shared a building 
and um, you know it was it's been working fine. We've had um, some challenges and some hurdles of having to change some different things within that. We probably will be adding more out there and hopefully expanding preschool in the future. But that's one model this year that um, I've been really proud of is just the integration of preschool teacher in the morning and we utilized all of the preschool materials in the classroom and then the TK students came in in the afternoon and I was proud of that because then we were offering AM and PM TK on the Rancho side of our district. Yeah, so we have at least some experience with doing right. some of that blending. Um, yes. I guess the last question for me then would be, uh, and I know you mentioned, again, we'll, we'll keep an eye on it. If it's working, that's great. If right. it's not, we'll then have to make some decisions. Um, Agreed. Do you have a, a sense right now, uh, and if you don't, that's okay, but I'd love to see it maybe at the when this comes back, what, what we would be looking for uh, to know whether it's working or not? That, well, I think definitely um, anecdotal data from staff. Um, you know, I know that Ms. Tara right now is a teacher that is a singleton at a school site, and I would love for her to have a partner, um, especially if it is a person that's interested in Montessori so that they could collaborate because teacher collaboration is um, one of the hallmarks of being able to bring a program to um, you know, all of the benefits that you can by having somebody to bounce ideas off of. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Well, I, I appreciate that. I am interested to hear from the public and uh, kind of hear some of the thoughts on this program. But again, I appreciate both the TK side of this and the work you guys put in and also um, you know, the collaboration that we've been able to do with the community and trying to figure out how to continue this program. So. Uh, unless there's other questions from the board, I'll bring it out to the public. Okay. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so we have several members from the public that would like to speak. Um, let's start with um, Ram. And I apologize if I'm getting the last name wrong. I'm not sure I'm reading it correctly. Don Gray. Okay. And that will be followed by Tara Marshall. Welcome. Uh, good evening, uh, board members. Uh, my name is Ram Dungre from Falsam. I'm here in support of uh, retaining the Montessori uh, program at Carl Sandal Elementary, and it's a uh, true intent of the program. Uh, my two kids attend uh, the local public schools, and my younger one is at uh, current uh, uh, student of Montessori at Carl Sandal. Uh, we love the current Montessori program, uh, which provides quality education at an affordable cost. Earlier this year, with the goal of 40K expansion, the uh, fate of program itself was a bit uncertain, but I appreciate your efforts towards uh, arriving at a compromise solution, uh, retaining the program and to introduce an afternoon TK program. Now, the nature of this program as whether it is a standard or a Montessori is not clear to me, especially the afternoon session. Uh, to maintain the true integrity of this uh, Montessori program, I urge you to uh, make it into a Montessori itself rather than a, a non-standard, rather than a standard uh, program. Uh, as mixing these two formats in a single class may not yield the best results. So thank you. Thank you. So thank you. All right, Tara Marshall is next, uh, followed by Andrew Seuss. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I, I first would like to express my gratitude to Mr. Clark for coming at the last minute notice to the classroom. I really appreciate his visit and my students did too. It was very nice to see you. And um, Kara is going to come tomorrow. So thank you to, for fitting us in. And Dr. Kaligian, I would like to say thank you to you for coming three times over the course of my um, tenure there at Sundall. I really appreciated your visits. And I wish you the best in your retirement. Um, and I also want to express my gratitude for this um, decision by the district um, <clears throat> to keep the mo morning Montessori intact. All the parents of current and upcoming preschool age students are very, very grateful for this decision. Um, however, I am, based on your presentation, Miss um, um, Carla Magno, um, my question is whether the afternoon teacher will be a general ed TK teacher, because you're saying you want to have 
a somebody who is open to Montessori. And I know we talked about that in our private meeting, but um, it sounds like maybe you you want it to be um, a, a teacher who would like maybe Montessori training or it might, did I hear you wrong? Or is it going to be an actual general ed teacher? Because if it is a general ed teacher, um, with all due respect, um, it won't work. It really won't because we, the classroom is, um, is filled with Montessori materials. In fact, I have asked Dr. Um, Mr. Frankel for a couple of years and also Ms. Himrick before that for additional um, shelving because I can't, I have many materials that are closeted that the district paid for and Montessori materials are very expensive and I, I don't have any space to put them on the shelves. So the whole classroom, um, you'll see I have a, a, a Miss Ross, she's a, a parent and she's gonna show a picture of the classroom. Um, but it, there's just no space for any of uh, the play-based materials that um, Angie or Miss Carla Magno has um, mentioned. There's just, there isn't any space. And the, the learning style is different. It's completely different. Um, the pedagogy is different. Um, yes, we do um, address or the curricula both include common core standards, um, and but but it's a different approach and it's a, a different philosophy. It's child-centered and we follow the child as far as what their interests are, but we also include, um, I, I've tried to, um, I have included the um, the Common Core standards as a, a main part of what I deliver um, within with the materials. Uh, so ah, I want more time, but thank you. That's thank you. all I have time for. <laughs> all right. Uh... Andrew Seuss is next, followed by Sierra Seuss. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks for being here tonight and staying up so late. Yeah. Whenever you're ready, Andrew. Hi, my name is Andrew. So Andrew went to preschool and kindergarten in the Montessori. He's in second grade now. And he just wanted to say, happy birthday, Miss Tara. <laughs> well, <laughs> he, he did want to say that, but he also um, wanted to say thank you for keeping the Montessori. He, he loved it. He even went back and helped a little bit last year with the other kids. So it's a, it's a really great program. And he just wanted to say thank you. Well, thank you, Andrew. Mm -hmm. Or no? It's smaller. <laughs> I miss my sister. Welcome, Sierra. I'm my brother's little sister, so I'm older than him. <laughs> Hello. Um, I like Mona. Like the teachers are really nice in Montessori, and. Thank you for not shutting it down. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, and, and I just wanted to add, um, I just wondered too, could the afternoon TK just be a Montessori TK? I mean, that seems like that would be the easiest thing. So I just wonder, would, would the rules allow the TK, rather than being a general ed TK, to be a Montessori TK? Because then, then the kids are all learning the same program, they're used to it, and then those kids can move to kindergarten. So to me, that seems that that would just be the easiest way to solve this, as long as it checked the boxes for the TK kids. So that's it. Thank you. All right, next up is uh, Jenny Lopez Friedrichs, followed by Emily Brown. So hi, again, um, I think the little ones want to say something that we brought uh, the whole clan. Um, the, the, our twins who are three were like, why does Emma get all the attention? We want to go too. So 
Plus, they wanted to be able to say what they thought about the Montessori program. But before I give the mic to them, we just wanted to, I just, we and I just wanted to say thank you to the board and to the staff um, just for taking the time and listening to us. I know um, we're a very passionate group, so we might have flooded your inboxes a little. Um, and then showing up to board meetings, but we really appreciate it. We appreciate feeling like we have a board and staff that are listening to us and, and are concerned about meeting our needs and, along with the rest of the community. So this is, you want to say your name? My name is Riley. Please don't set your class down. <laughs> you like Montessori? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Riley. <laughs> say thank you. Thank you. Emma, you think it's your turn? <laughs> Jesse's our shy one, but that's it, baby. We're going to be done. Did you want to come up? Okay. Well, again, thank you very much for your time. And, and I know some of you have and do plan on coming and visiting the Montessori program and seeing the, the great community and progress and, and everything that we're, that Ms. Tara and Ms. Marissa are doing. So again, we just, again, wanted to extend our gratitude and appreciation. Thank you. All right. Uh, next up is Emily Brown, followed by Amanda Ross. So I just wanted to share a little bit of my personal experience with the Montessori class. Um, <clears throat> I come as a parent of four young kids. Um, three of them have been taught by Miss Tara in her Montessori classroom. My oldest is now in seventh grade. Um, I have a fourth grader now. <clears throat> Excuse me, and this is my youngest, Nora. She's currently in kindergarten and in her third year of the Montessori program. <clears throat> Excuse me. My third grade daughter unfortunately missed out on the experience because of the whole COVID Zoom situation. Um, all three of my children really thrived in the Montessori environment, but Nora in particular. Um, this might be because she's the only one of my three kids that was able to do all three years of the program starting in preschool, and she's just simply blossoming because of it. When she first joined the classroom in 2021, she spoke infrequently, especially outside the home. Now halfway through her third year, she's a chatterbox smarty pants who loves school. She regularly tells us at home about her days, the jobs that she worked on, how she was able to assist a younger child with a job, or she'll quiz us on a new skill or piece of knowledge that she acquired during that day and is excited to demonstrate. She's learning at an extraordinary rate, letters, sounds, numbers, addition, and even the practical life skills that Montessori is known for. So one example of how the district's Montessori program has given her the space and the tools to stretch herself. On her fifth birthday walk around the sun ritual in the classroom, which was in her second year of Montessori, she said her goal before turning six, spring of kinder year, was to learn to count to a thousand. A thousand, you guys. Look at my five-year-old making smart goals, specific, <laughs> measurable, achievable. I'm kidding. <clears throat> but it did take a while for it to sink in with me how great of a goal this was. As a reference point, when my older daughter, Lily, was in the general ed kindergarten at the same school just three years ago, the expectation was that she should be able to count to 100 by the end of the school year. And I don't think it ever occurred to her to aim higher. Five-year-old Nora, with her eyes open to so many possibilities and with the freedom to stretch herself in her own specific areas of interest, set a more ambitious goal. And now seven months later, even though she hasn't mentioned it at home for months, she hasn't forgotten her goal. To the contrary, she's actively and successfully using the Montessori method to achieve it. I know this because when I asked Nora recently, what do you like about your Mont Montessori class? This is what she said. I like Miss Tara because she teaches me really good things. My favorite job is the 100 board because I'm still learning to count to 1,000, and that's a really good way to count to 1,000. My other favorite job is puzzles, big puzzles, and I also like Miss Tara because she teaches me hard things. This is a really unique opportunity to expand this program, not to diminish it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Amanda Ross, and we'll be followed by uh, Aaron Cotton.
Thank you, President Huey and board members. Um, as you can see, I brought visual aids. Um, <laughs> I had a prepared statement, but I'm gonna try and wing it. Um, so I, I'm very pleased that my daughter is in the Montessori program at Carl Sundahl. I think it's a very valuable program, and I'm glad that the district is wanting to keep the AM program as is. I think that's really important. But I also think that the classroom is set up to be Montessori. It is filled with Montessori-specific materials. Ms. Tara has spent years crafting and cultivating this classroom to be what it needs to be to really ex make this program what it is, which is an invaluable program to this district. I think it's really important. And so I don't quite understand how you're going to get general and TK in this classroom without impacting the Montessori program as it is now, because you're, you're going to have to. You're going to have to move things around to try to get other types of curriculum in here. And I think it's going to be kind of confusing for the kids. You're talking about blending two completely different curriculum programs and two completely different methods in how you're teaching them. And I, I think kindergarten is an important step to get ready for first grade. And I think messing around with a year of kindergarten kids is not the best way to go about it. I think you're trying to stick a round peg into a square hole. And I just don't think that, you know, trying to pilot something like that is really the best approach to it. So I really urge you to look at hiring a Montessori accredited teacher who knows what they're doing, who knows how to use the material and can introduce that to the TK. I mean, I think having TK in the afternoon with the kindergartners is a great compromise. It allows you to get the TK slots that you need uh, to be able to make the TK, you know, numbers necessary for the district. And, and I know that there is a need for TK. Um, I think that Angie mentioned there were 13 people interested in general ed um, at the front office, and I heard there were 20 Montessori that were interested. And I think that the front, from what I heard, the front office was having parents sign up for both lists because they weren't sure what was going to happen. So I'm not sure how many of them, you know, would are are doubled up their Montessori and general ed, right? Um, and and so I I think, you know, having a Montessori trained teacher for TK is just going to be the way that we get to the resolution here. I mean, we are so grateful for staff and you guys for listening to us and for wanting to keep the program. I think it's it's a great program. I mean, this is, you know, something that you generally have to pay like $800 if you were going to do a part-time Montessori privately. It's $800 a month. And this is something that's affordable for the area and, and available for a really unique way for kids to learn that isn't general ed and provided by the district. So I just really encourage you to have the staff hire a Montessori trained TK teacher to keep using the Montessori material you've already invested in. I mean, this is like high quality Montessori material that, that is, is really fostering this Montessori method for these kids and really giving them, as you've heard, a really great start in life. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And the final uh, in-person card I have is Aaron Cotton says on behalf of Megan Babb. Do you mind if I read the statement? Is that okay? Yes. That all these parents have kids, they all had to go. Um, give me a minute, let me pull it up. Um, so this is Megan Babb's statement. As a physician in this community, I have found that the most valuable tool that I can provide to my pediatric patients is to allow them a space to be their authentic self. I listen to many who have struggled to find the same opportunity in our education system. It is my hope that we continue to foster creative minds, big ideas, and an education home where they can explore who they truly are. I believe Montessori provides that. I have four children. My three youngest attend the Carl Sundahl Montessori program. I got an opportunity to watch them thrive in a way I did not get to see in my oldest. I watched them take ownership of their decisions, grow to become leaders in their respective classes, and gain a perspective of what it means to give back to a community of peers. I recognize that the Montessori method may not be for all. However, it is my hope that the school board tonight recognizes that by leaving the program as is or expanding the class to allow for more Montessori students, the board is also giving more children an opportunity to be courageous, be creative, be mindful and independent as they start their education journey. There is always time for them to continue to grow in a traditional general education model, but only a small window where the district provides them something different. Providing a space for an alternative learning style will only benefit the school and future students. I ask for you to consider as a mother, a physician, and a fierce advocate of children. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to take it out to online. Looks like there are no hands raised online. Uh, so we're going to bring it back to the board for discussion. Just want to remind the board, this is only a discussion item. Come back to us uh, at our next board meeting on the 15th. So uh, any further questions or, or discussion um, regarding the program? <clears throat> Mr. Clark? Oh, it's just a 
clear my happened. throat, but <laughs> Mr. President, if I may, yes, please. Uh, just want to thank Ms. Tara for having me in her class today. I mean, it was just phenomenal to see the interaction uh, between the you know three and five year olds and them working at their own pace and. I mean, they were actually working on puzzles, and I mean, they had their stations and everything. And I was just amazed by the program because I always had, and I know my visits to Sundal, I never went there, I'm sorry, but um, it was just interesting to see how that program was working. Um, combining uh, the blend of the TK and K, I, I don't see how that would work. I really don't with the size of that classroom, the way that it's laid out and everything. It, maybe I'm wrong again, um, but I just don't see how that would work. So hopefully we can figure something out. Um, you know, I know the portable ideas, the budget wise is not gonna work, but um, you know, I heard some te uh, parents talk about uh, just making it a, you know, PM Montessori with the TK. Um, and kindergarten, so hopefully we can work on that. And Ms. Tara, tell Sierra, I don't break promises, mm -hmm. and thank her so much for the picture. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Sierra. Appreciate you. So, um, yeah, so that's it. Thanks, Mr. Clark. Um, I just had a quick question, and I think um, from being on both sides, I know that it, it the job qualifications can be very guided by the district and by Ms. Tara, because you'll be co-teaching and helping on that interview panel. Um, so while I recognize things are hard, um, change is hard, and, and kind of reconfiguring your mind of what this would look like and how could this work, um, I promise as a general ed teacher, no two of us are alike. And so um, at the end of the day, I think that the, the end goal will be finding you the right match because um, when you look at the Common Core standards, you are teaching those. And so while a certain curriculum will be available and certain tools will be available, it also doesn't mean that they aren't using Montessori tools to get to the same end result. And so I think at the end of the day, what's really going to matter is finding the right person to co-teach with you in that space who knows how to use those tools and is familiar with that. And maybe they're a general ed teacher at the same time. So. Um, and I, I understand your, your resistance to that, but knowing that I came from a general ed classroom and complete 180 if you were to walk into my learning center of what, what is offered, there are general ed teachers who do not want to follow a very strict curriculum to get to the same goal at the end. And so I think that your insight and your participation in the hiring process will be what maintains the wholeness of your program for ages three through five. And um, again, anything new is always sort of a scary, th scary thing to walk into. Um, while I would love to see this to be a full program all the way through, that also doesn't mean that we aren't presenting the TK program at Carl Sundell as Montessori um, for those students. They will be getting the general ed curriculum, but that curriculum is Common Core Standards, which they're already getting. And so also maybe reframing the way that, that it's written, because if your Montessori students are receiving Common Core, that is the standards that any curriculum is based on. And so as long as that's the focus, and as long as you have all of those tools available, you're really not blending any two new things, um, except for maybe an additional set of tools, which may or may not be used to get to those common core standards at the end. And so um, again, I think the, the biggest thing is going to be finding the right person to come into that classroom. and crossing that bridge when we get to it. If that right person isn't available, then what? And, and answering that question at that point, because we have no idea who's out there. We have no idea who would just absolutely love and thrive in that environment. And with your guidance and with your leadership and with the community that's around of what's so important in that class and community, I have no doubt that it could be a expanded program of what you're doing right now. 
Go ahead, Mr. Reed. Yeah, I, I uh, agree with Board Member Clark's uh, assessment and comments. Um, I'm wondering, is there anything that pre prevents the district from operating the afternoon TK as a Montessori? Was there anything in, in state law that was adopted when we adopt, when the state adopted the TK program that pre pre prevents us from operating that TK afternoon as a Montessori? Mr. Reed, I was not here at the in, in this position at the inception of the Montessori, so I'd have to research that question. Okay. Um, well, actually, it's not at the inception of the Montessori. It would be the, the law that was adopted two, two years ago, I think it was, the TK law. Uh, oh, you mean... I see what you're saying. Yeah. I'm sorry. I misunderstood what you were saying. Okay. So um, it's up to our district on how we are expanding TK. Um, but I, as I said before, we had parents that were opting into our half-day kindergarten programs. And so I would imagine, and as many classrooms that we have added uh, this year and in the past, that it's going to continue as the age span widens. So... I would imagine that there's probably going to be um, interest in TK and or Montessori and general education TK. Okay. Um, I know it's just for discussion tonight. Um, I guess, you know, my preference would be if there's any way possible for us to preserve an AM and PM Montessori TK, um, I would be uh, supportive of that. I, I can see how having a classroom that pivots uh, with instructional material uh, could be problematic uh, given the unique nature of the Montessori program. So, I, I mean, I understand we have space issues. Uh, I guess I, I would just personally uh, appreciate the, the district staff taking another look at the possibility of, of uh, uh, utilizing that room for both AM and PM uh, Montessori as a TK uh, program. Those are my observations. Ms. Leary. Um, Yeah, I think I would agree with that assessment, but I also agree with Ms. Lofthouse as she is somewhat of a subject matter expert. So, um, you know, I think if she thinks that there is also a possibility that if we, if we can't manage to do AM, PM, that way that, you know, I think that there probably is a way that we could probably still make this work. So I'm kind of in the middle of it. Um, I would love to see some additional exploration if we could do it in the afternoon. That would be like the optimal. Um, and if not, I think we have a secondary backup plan that sounds like could possibly work. Um, and then maybe what we could do is maybe if we end up having to go that route, maybe like a half a year, like check in with it to kind of let us know like where we're at and how that integration's going. If that's the route that we end up having to take, that would maybe be good because if we have to reevaluate that for the following year, I would rather do that sooner than later. So maybe I can ask the board if, you know, if we were to be able to find a, a Montessori teacher, would the board be open to continuing it as a full Montessori program? It looks like yes. So I, I kind of agree, Ms. Laird. I, yeah, I, I mean, the primary goal for me would be to continue it as Montessori program. Uh, I don't know how we can guarantee that we're going to find that teacher. I, I think if we go into it saying, if we find one, then we'll continue it that way, we're not going to maybe look as hard as we should. So I, I would love to direct the board to say, let's go find a Montessori teacher for this TK, uh, for the afternoon program. If we get to a point in the year, you know, you guys will have to let us know when that is that we're not finding anything, let's let's talk again. Um, but I, I, I would just prefer our primary goal is, let's go find a Montessori afternoon teacher. The other question I have in that, and um, it looks like we're all in agreement on that, by the way, so if that's direction enough for when we come back with the uh, February 15th item. We would be bringing this back for action then for this particular section of the afternoon and the PM. Right. And what I'm hearing is consensus for 
looking for a Montessori trained teacher. Correct, and then maintaining the integrity of the Montessori program throughout the entire day. Um, that's our. That would be the board's, uh, the board's primary purpose. Uh, I guess the other question I have is, let you know, Mr. Clark's favorite. What if? What if we don't find uh, that teacher? I I guess, and forgive my ignorance on this. Um, you know, if, if we hired somebody who was interested in Montessori, is there training that we would be providing throughout the year or could send that teacher to? Um, it's okay if there's no answer for that tonight, but maybe on the 15th, if if that's going to be more clear then, I would be uh, curious to hear that. Um, so, okay, it sounds like we're all kind of in agreement on this. I think we're certainly all in agreement on the rest of our TK programs. Um, so as this comes back to us in two weeks, uh, that is the direction of the board right now. Let's let's intend to make this a full Montessori program, uh, go searching for a Montessori teacher. Um, and then maybe if you can just let us know what is what is the date I mean, at which if we haven't found somebody that we're going to have to make some um, uh, concessions on that, I suppose. Um, but otherwise, I, I do want to say I, I, and I really appreciate the district and appreciate um, all of the parents that have been in the Montessori program. It's been a really, I think, good collaboration. And so thanks for being able to all work together. Um, and did want to acknowledge, um, I think Ms. Ross, you had sent a letter on behalf of the parents. I just want to acknowledge that we did receive that letter. Um, okay. <laughs> That'd be okay, uh, Ms. Kaligian, if she... Dr. Kligan, if uh, Ms. Ross brings this paper up and we yes, submit that. Okay, I'll bring it over to Marcia. Uh, great. So, again, just discussion. There's no uh, action on that until the 15th. Um, so, that then brings us to discussion item 12. Uh, sorry, discussion item uh, A, which we are doing second follow up with super, Superintendent Search Firm. Uh, so, Ms. Anderson, I'll invite you up and uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, and also just want to thank all of the families and especially students that have stayed up way past my bedtime. Uh, thanks for being here. I was really upset she didn't get to talk. But that was my fault. But she just want to say thank you. <laughs> Good night. This is an updated... All right, welcome back, uh, Ms. Anderson and uh, Sunny. We appreciate you being here. I think we have a few items we need to uh, yes. kind of make sure we're agreed upon tonight, oh, and yes. then we can be moving forward with the search of the new superintendent. So with that, if it's okay if I hand it over to you to walk us through that. Sure. Well, good evening, uh, board and student trustee Trustee today. Huh? It's good to see you again. I'm super excited as Dr. DeMarta and I um, kind of share with you kind of where we are in the process and just need your feedback. So, you know, we were with you um, a couple weeks back. And so today should be pretty quick because you've gotten all of the information. You've gotten to um, have your own time to collaborate through your study session work. Um, so we have several documents. We just need to get your kind of direction so that we can start the next phase of the work, which is advertising the position um, and really um, officially getting the ball rolling on our calendar. So with that, I think the easiest way is to pull up the calendar. And so what we did is based on your um, feedback with dates, you name it, um, we updated it to, um, I think we're now on version number three. Um, so sounds, I don't know. sounds like our typical calendar. Uh, yeah. And so, um, yeah, so that's the one right there. Perfect. So just want to make sure that um, you all, if you have any questions, um, we made a few adjustments. So um, obviously we met with you um, ja January 18th just to kind of get the ball rolling. You got a chance to meet and discuss your criteria. So as of today, the only changes we had was um, your... Um, what we call now fourth board meeting, which would be your special meeting where we meet with you to actually go through your um, the candidates and then also your interviews, which would be um, you have April 10th and then April 20 and 21. And as we shared before, those are things that are kind of up in the air. We'll know more on April 10th because that's when you'll get to decide how many candidates you're going to actually interview. And that will dictate your schedule on April 20 or 21, if that makes sense. 
So those are the two big changes to the calendar. Um, so I just wanna see if there was any questions uh, or comments before we officially finalize this, because this is gonna drive the process. And some of this will be shared actually in the uh, application, uh, sorry, the advertisement. So the candidates know when to the, hold these dates, especially the interviews. Great. Uh, any questions from the board regarding the calendar? It doesn't sound like it. I, I would just clarify, I think you just mentioned it. Uh, April 10th, it sounds like we'll determine, we're planning for coming back two days uh, on the 20th and 21st, but for whatever reason, we you know, only have, let's say three or four candidates, yep. then we would make that uh, just a one day on that 20th. Yeah, good question. So part of what we gave you, a, a lot of information, but we gave you some sample interview schedules, right? And just kind of giving you a sense of what those days could look like. But there's a couple of things we do have to discuss tonight. One is just picking those dates so you have those, but then also it depends on how you decide to do your interviews. So we do need to talk about if you're gonna have a, a, a stakeholder uh, panel, right? Or if you're not gonna have one, that would also dictate how much time uh, that takes. So. Um, we can do that in a moment, but just want to make sure the calendar is good for everyone. So no birthday parties and <laughs> weddings and going on a trip or anything like you got to be like, it is super important that every board member is at the interviews in particular. So I just want to emphasize that. Yeah, no, I think we are all good. Yeah. It's on all of our calendars. Okay, so okay. Thank perfect, you. perfect. All right. So um, anything to add for the calendar, Dr. DeMarto? Yeah, I think we're good on that. And so the other piece of the calendar um, that we want to just highlight was the um, stakeholder input session. So we're excited. The staff worked really hard. So thank you. It's been a lot. Um, I know to kind of go back and forth, but um, the stakeholder um, input me uh, meetings are where Dr. DeMarto and I are going to be meeting with your various stakeholders. You may recall you identified those. So if you go to the, um, scroll down just a little bit, well, actually, well, yeah, scroll down just a little bit. And we'll go back to the questions in a moment. But you'll notice on this document, um, you'll see the various groups that you all wanted to hear from. So they were um, very clever with how to fit all of those in in a two week period. So if you keep going a little bit further down, um, you can see these are kind of our rough notes of everyone we wanted to cover. Um, and so we'll update a few of those, but we've covered pretty much everyone. And so what we want to say just kind of in the public space is that those community kind of open forums are really for anyone to come. So there may not, while some may say, oh, we don't have a specific stakeholder that's been identified to be like personally invited, it is open to anyone. And honestly, if someone can't make one session, they can come to another. So this is the schedule. Um, I know it will be put on your, I believe, website, if I'm saying that correctly, um, a space. And, and I will say that it's helpful to have on the website kind of a superintendent search kind of space so it's easy to find. Um, it will include the survey link. So that same stakeholder input sessions will have four questions that we will be asking the community to give input on. Um, they're typically about an hour. And those four questions, um, are actually listed at the top of the document, but we shared last time is what's good about the community, what's good about the district, and then also what are some of the issues that the new superintendent should be aware of. And then lastly, this is where that whole criteria conversation comes in, is while the, the community doesn't really tell you what the criteria and job description is, they do tell you, and a question is, what do they want to see in the next superintendent? So they give characteristics and skills and attributes, and so that will help you go back to looking at your criteria with the final kind of, you know, um, update if you would like, if that makes sense. Yep. So, uh, yes. Yeah, I'd love to jump in real quick. You mentioned on our, our website, it would be good to have a superintendent search section. Is that, I mean, yeah. Dr. Reagan, is that something we've discussed? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, just to make it easy. Yeah. It's already up. There we go. No, it's not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Okay. Yeah, it's coming. Coming soon, coming soon, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Yeah, and so we'll, um, we actually, there's a couple of things we recommend having on there, but definitely the links to the application, obviously this schedule, um, some districts do it differently, you know, where it makes it something that pops up. So it's real easy for the next two weeks, right? Having something that pops up. So that's all, I think stuff that your, your staff is experts at, but it's just making sure we have this solidified. So I think we're pretty much there. Um, and there may be a shift here and there for some things that we may do. Most of these are virtual. Um, there's a few in person um, and we'll have some flexibility to adjust if needed. Um, I do want to add if you have like individuals that you want us to meet with. And so sometimes, for example, like 
the police chief or the mayor, you know, like individuals who are really busy and can't necessarily follow our schedule. We also have done one-on-one -on -one interviews with people as well. So if that comes up where you're like, hey, we think we really want to hear from this person, just let us know and we can add them to our list. Great. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's quite a list. Uh, yeah, yeah, so appreciate all the work on that. Any any questions from the board about the stakeholder input and this calendar that's been mm -hmm. put together? Uh, can you scroll back up to the stakeholder groups? Mm -hmm. Was there, I see there's a, okay, all right, you have the, the Chamber of Commerce. All right, okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Uh, Mr. President. Uh, looking at AFB student leaders, diverse student body, and student board reps, could that be combined? Is there any way that maybe they can, I don't know if this would be in a line of, looking at the date here, having them come to a um, student advisory board meeting? I don't know if it, that's... The, the timings didn't work to make it for an SAB I meeting. We actually worked with the, 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 the board, uh, student board members and uh, the um, advisors to find a time that worked for them. So that... Okay, that it was, so we our, worked our directly student board with reps, them. but are we talking about... No, the SAB, the entire SAB. Oh, okay. We, we, we worked with the team, and I forget, Matthew, if it was you or Van. Yeah, it was we, both me and Van. Yeah, um, they confirmed the time. Yeah, everyone, uh, we posted it to the SAB, like that oh. communications thing, so everyone's able to attend. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, sir. Great. And if there's any issue that come up where you like, there's students who just voices couldn't be heard, right? And this is really with all, but I love when students actually can do this and like we can talk to them. Um, but I would say let us know because we can definitely carve out some time if there's maybe a group you're like, we really want to hear from them. Um, but remember, anyone who can't make this schedule, I want to emphasize, that's why the survey is available. And the survey actually has exactly the same questions. It's in English and in Spanish, and it goes to the same report. So you will have people that may say, this didn't work and we didn't get to give input. And it's like, no, you can give input. It just may not be talking with us, but the survey is exactly the same. And that information goes into that input report. So we want to just emphasize that, that there's never a good date for everyone, but we don't want to exclude anyone either. Um, and again, if there's anyone who has any accommodations needed, they're like, you know, the technology doesn't work well, and we need a paper copy, we can also provide that. But we just want to make sure everyone has the opportunity to give input, um, knowing that everyone can't join. But those virtuals give people, I think, a better opportunity. Um, so looking forward to it. Yes, Ms. Anderson, yeah. if I can ask real quick, I'm, I'm looking to see if there are any, and I don't see it, nonprofits, Hands for Hope, um, Folsom Heart, Rancho Heart, uh, you know, to, mm -hmm. I mean, they may be interested. Uh, Folsom Cordova Community Partnership might be interested, might. Yeah, I think what would happen is you all have a better sense of who they are than us. I think, if I'm not mistaken, they might fall under the business community category. I'm not business. positive, but there are the, the invitation. I think that would be what's more important is to invite them to yeah. which one to come I, to. I think that you know, yeah. uh, Angela and the communications team is going to work on a, a broad distribution group. If the board has someone specific that they would like us to distribute to, we can definitely add those to the to the group. So it's going to be an you know, email blast out to all of the different groups and communicated uh, regularly as well and on our website. So if there, but if there are specific groups that you would like to make sure that we've communicated directly to, please let us know. Okay, so do you just want us to email you with those names? Yeah, that would be fine. Like you could just I'm email us the, the food list. lockers from both Yeah, if you have, a, obviously if you have a contact or an email that you would like us to, to connect to, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Again, we have um, all of those dates and then we also have two dates at the very end, one in person and then mm -hmm. one virtually that's open to all groups as well as um, as Nicole said, there's a lot of other opportunities too. So. And just for the team, there's also room for more to be added in if they can't fit into this schedule. Okay. Yeah, and just remember, there's more space on the schedule where we're available. We need to add some in. So I'll just to you know help out with that if, you, if necessary. Um, so you've got a little flexibility. So yeah, that's it for that piece. Any other questions in terms of the stakeholder input? So you'll see on the calendar, you'll get that um, report on March 7th. So you'll actually see the input and then we can go back to your criteria and see if there's anything you feel you have some epiphanies about what you may wanna adjust. Because remember the criteria actually drives your questions for the interviews, right? And also how we screen, 
how we decide who you're going to interview, all those things do matter. So just giving you that input. All right. Anything we're forgetting on that one? All right. And so, um, so we got our calendar. We're good. Our stakeholder input schedule. Um, so then the next piece would be, um, <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to flip flop a little bit. We do need to get your criteria um, to be approved, but I want to go to the piece about the stakeholder interview um, panel. Um, tonight, we don't intend for you to make that decision because I think the last time we talked, it seemed like y'all were still wrestling with that. Um, and so while it is something we want to confirm, um, we know that you do have some time to study those documents we gave you in terms of like who you put on that, you know, as far as composition. Um, and you do need a little bit of lead time to let people know so that they can carve out their schedules to be there for those interview days. Um, but I wanted to just open it up to see if there were questions or additional considerations before you make that decision. Because once you do, then that helps us know how to plan moving forward. And I do recognize that, um, again, you may not have to make that decision tonight, but I believe you have one more board meeting before March 7th, because Mar by March 7th, you need to like decide that because you have to take action and because it's an ad hoc committee. Um, so I just want to open it up to see if there was any questions or additional discussion about that. So last meeting, I think you all weren't sure. Um, and again, you don't have to make a decision tonight. I just wanted to give that opportunity. I just have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I think we all received the same feedback at one point about um, some superintendents are not want, they will not necessarily want to apply knowing that there is this committee that they mm -hmm. would be interviewing with based on confidentiality mm -hmm. and knowing that they are interviewing sort of with with the hope to get the job but potentially not right. and having to return to their current district yeah. um have you seen that as as a kind of a barrier for some people to interview overall i'd say no um, all the searches I've done, I think with the exception of one, we've had a stakeholder um, panel and we have a process, of course, I shared last time where there is a, a confidentiality affidavit statement that is signed by everyone. Um, we have a whole orientation with that group. Um, and I think because of our process, they buy into it so well that people respect that confidentiality. However, I will say that to your point, there are people who feel more comfortable with a closed process, as we call it, um, versus that open where it allows people to really be a part of that interview process. Um, we haven't had any issues with it, but I do understand that that might make people a little nervous, but it hasn't, to my knowledge, um, detoured great candidates from applying. What they do say is they are concerned about it. And so they let us know, like, look, we need this to be really confidential. Um, they ask us about the process. And a lot of them will say, like, as a sitting superintendent, I want this to be confidential until I'm a finalist. And that's typically the process. Um, but I, it is it is something people brought up. But for our, I can only say my experience, I've done 12 now, 13. I'm kind of losing track now. It, it really hasn't been a huge barrier for us. Um, but it is something you all have to consider. And I do say to boards, you know your community better than we do, right? But in our experience, we haven't had that confidentiality issue or breach of it. So I feel good about it. Um, I, we advocate for it, but we also, it's your interview process. So you do have to make that decision and what is most comfortable for you as a board. So do you want to add anything to that in terms of no, that? I, yeah. it, on the searches that I've been, it's not been a problem. But candidates will, oops. Candidates will say that I want to keep this confidential until I'm a finalist because they're a sitting superintendent. They don't want to jeopardize their job. End up, they're not a finalist and they have no job. So anyway, it's just protecting themselves. So I, I am curious. If we don't have to make the decision tonight, but if we are all on the same page tonight, we might as well. Uh, so I don't know if there are some thoughts uh, about where people are leaning with this. Um, Mr. Clark? I'm leaning on keeping it closed. Mm -hmm. um, I think it muddies the water a little bit when you have two interviews going on simultaneously. I mean, it just, because we're crunched that weekend yeah. and we don't know what that short list is going to be, whether it's going to be 10, 6, 3, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I think the time that we can take because the board is going to have to deliberate yeah. 
and the board is going to have to be unanimous yep. in making this decision. So <laughs> I, I just think that, um, you know, our role as school board members is, you know, when it comes to the superintendent is to interview and yep. select. And I, I just think that if you're adding that extra layer, it okay. just delays the process and makes it longer. Okay. Um, and that's kind of the feedback that I got last weekend. Uh, speaking to my other colleagues mm -hmm. across the state, and they okay. just said, yeah, I don't, they don't see it working that way. I mean, okay. some have, but, you know, the majority of them said, no. Nah. Okay, okay, thank you. Mr. Reed? Yeah, I agree with Board Member Clark. Okay. Ms. Larry? Yeah, I, I agree as well. Okay. Ms. Lofthouse? I feel like I could go either way. I just really, really want to um, urge every stakeholder to have their voice heard and make sure that we have ample time to to read that and and really weigh that um so i'm hoping for some major promotion on the surveys and those those events just to ensure that we get as much feedback as possible prior to going into um the interview process so yeah mr miller i agree with mr clark I think I would be I would think I would be more concerned about it if we didn't have a pretty robust calendar here of opportunities for the stakeholder input. But I would agree. I think we need to really be pushing it out and um, and us as a board pushing it out into the community of encouraging parents and, and staff members and things like that to really participate in that process so that we're really getting that good deep dive into what we need as we move into this next stage. Yeah. Uh, I agree with Mr. Clark as well, and I, I think uh, both with what Mr. Clark shared and then also with what Dr. Camp shared at our uh, board study session that, uh, you know, held a lot of, that meant a lot to me. So the fact that he, uh, you know, slowed down enough to even suggest that maybe we think twice about it, um, I, I would want to follow his lead as well as, you know, the suggestions uh, from our colleagues. We don't have to decide this tonight, so if anybody is on the fence, I don't think we necessarily should. Um, so not to put you on the spot, Miss Left House, but uh, would you be okay with that? Tonight. Okay. Yeah. And Ms. so it sounds like all of us then are okay saying okay. let's move forward as a, with a closed process. Okay. So just to clarify, we're going to not have a stakeholder interview panel, but what I do hear is try to get as much input as possible. So what we'll do is we'll have our normal schedule that you saw earlier, and then when we get close to the end of that window, we can talk about, actually prior to your uh, meeting on the 15th, I can actually just share so that you all can have that information of how many people have given input, because what it may do is say, hey, let's just keep the window open for the survey. Um, or maybe it means we'll try to hold one more meeting. Um, it just all depends on the schedule. But I think that survey, getting that pushed out, that's where you do get a lot more traction because it's more accessible to people. So that probably would be something we could talk about before your next meeting so that you can feel better about we got as much as possible. Um, and we can talk a little bit later once you get that survey data about kind of traditionally what we get from, you know, what's, what's a good response rate. Because um, as you know, you all survey a lot of people. So... Um, it, it becomes challenging when it's like another survey, but if we can really promote that um, in the next, you know, board meeting as well, just continue to keep that going. And of course you have, you know, your great team to be able to push it out. Great. So sounds like a plan. Um, and so last but not least, um, what's a really critical part of the process is to make sure you all confirm for us what is the job description or what we call the criteria for the next superintendent. So you all had a chance to give some input, which was really helpful. We took some sample language, really kind of um, tried to synthesize it to really meet your vision for the five areas. And then what we also did, which you see in front of you, is we gave kind of a uh, what we call a um, like a kind of an overall summary of what you want from this person, like a, just an overarching qualification. Um, and so you can see it's it's centered more around the language that's student-centered language, right? Because that seems to be kind of the overarching vision that you all collectively had. But then, of course, you have to be very specific with the five criteria. So that's the only difference that you may see in that particular document. And there may be a few things we need to clean up as far as, you know, a word here and there. Maybe it's a period versus a, a, a colon versus a comma kind of thing. So we'll do one last once over with that. But this was this is kind of the the draft that we want to get feedback from you all so that we can move to advertisement. 
And, and there is something at the end I'll ask you about in terms of the the um, preferences and requirements. But go ahead, sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. The only difference on these, just to make sure the board's clear, is uh, yeah. we had the that original version. I know I had talked with you about yeah. uh, one of the desires of the board, as you just mentioned, is that student-centered is the yeah. overarching yeah. Uh, driver of all these qualifications. So just to clarify that the all of the qualifications are the same. Yes. It's just that opening yep. paragraph just, that says just the develop the qualification. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so and I'm open if, if the board is happier with the first version compare it second, we can always do that. Um, I had asked uh, Miss Anderson to kind of write up that this this paragraph in this newer version. Uh, any questions from the board around the qualifications? Or do, you, do you feel like uh, if we haven't captured something you were hoping to capture? Um, yeah, Mr. President. Mm -hmm. um, I have four, actually, now that I'm looking at this revised, no, that was in the original one, too. Um, I have, I guess, five items. I think they're all, like, small issues. Mm -hmm. And, okay. you know, maybe I, I, I'd be fine with it just remaining as it is. But... Um, uh, under an effective educator, uh, second line down, it says including our underserved and most vulnerable youth and children, uh, youth and families. Um, you know, I, I, I hate to parse, uh, you know, who's most and who's not most. I would just uh, delete the word most. So okay. it says including it. our underserved and vulnerable youth and families. Got it. Um, in, uh, Everybody else good with that? Uh, let's see, uh, under a visionary and innovative leader, unless it was caught, there was a typo. Let's see, uh, maybe it was caught. Uh, one, two, three, four strategies, strategies. Where is yeah, it? I think we took care of that. Yeah, there was a two, there was yeah. an extraneous word there. Okay, mm -hmm. all right, so that was taken care of. Um, under an educational equity leader, mm -hmm. um, the Second to last line, it says, um, this leader actively engages in the interruption of policies, practices, and structures. Um, that, uh, I guess, I, rather than the interruption, I would, I guess, prefer highlighting to the board. So this leader actively engages in highlighting to the board policies, practices, and structures, because otherwise you're, you're encouraging the person to engage in the subordination of board policies. Yeah, so um, to, so we can change that language just to give clarity of where that came from. Because remember, yeah. we've done this particular, a um, lot of boards wanted an equity leader. So yeah. the interpretation of that is really about not just policy, right? But there are things like grading policies, which you all have looked at, right? That is, maybe the word may need to be more examined, right? Something like that. Examine, because I yeah. see what you're saying. It's like, we don't want people to actively do like the total opposite of what their role is, but it really is centered around an interruption. And that is terminology used in the equity world. So I think you, what you all are comfortable with, I think is important, but just to give context of the background of where that language came from. Oh, yeah, I, I understand. Yeah. I just, uh, you know, I, I, I just, again, I, yeah. you know, I, 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 I don't really care what, I guess, what the, okay alternate word is. I just I wouldn't want a word that would seem to suggest that we want the next superintendent to engage in, in subordination. Uh, I, I would, would be but yeah, I would venture to say that I would want interruption to still occur because I think many of our policies and practices and structures sure, sure, sure. are inequitable. So maybe we are looking at interruption of inequitable policies, practices. Okay. And structures, there you go. I, 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 ultimately, I don't care. I mean, okay. it, it's it, it's you know, I, I, think, I think that's a can, nice balance. We actually. can use it we can use sense. our judgment. You know, obviously with the candidates, yeah. but uh, I have one small thing um, on the last page when it says sample languages. <laughs> it, there's a bullet point about. The ability to speak oh. Spanish is preferred, and then the last bullet point says the ability to speak Spanish and or Vietnamese yeah. is preferred. So so one sec, we're going to get to that. That's a totally separate piece to the criteria. We're going to get to that at the end, because that's about the requirements and um, and uh, preferences. So hold that thought, because actually we're going to need feedback on that. All right. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Reed, were you finished? Yeah, actually, I, I, okay. I had one other one, but I, honestly, I don't want to nitpick. I, I, I think... Overall, this is exactly what we're looking for. Um, good. Okay. So. Capture. All right. Good. Good stuff. Um, 
I have just one mm -hmm. where under an effective educator, I would change research based to research affirmed personally. Okay. You say research, research affirmed. Yeah. Tell us more in your context. So um, I think that there's, uh, so an effective educator and then one, two, three, fourth line down. Yep. So tell us more when you say research or firm versus research based. It's just, well, I know for language purposes, just to clarify for people who don't. Right. So I would say in education world, there's a lot of research and there's a lot of research based mm -hmm. programs. And mm -hmm. when looking at data, we want that and yep. data to affirm that the that research has actually yeah. been yep. successful. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, we've used other language too. Like sometimes you'll say promising practices versus best practices, right? But I just want to make sure one heard like the context of that because um, that's actually helpful. So we can adjust that for sure. Um, yep, thank you for that. Anything else? One other one, sorry. And I just caught it. Um, right past that where it says culturally relevant, I would maybe change it to responsive. Mm -hmm. Anyone have objections or? That's good. I want to add, add, um, sometimes people say both words because they do have context to relevant, but responsive. You good with replacing that? I'm good with responsive. Okay. Yeah. Oops. Okay. Uh, anything else for that piece? And then we can get to the preferences and um, requirements, and then we'll be out of your way. Looks like we're all good. No other questions on that? Okay. All right. Da, 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 da. Okay. All right. So um, the last piece of it, and this is really helpful for our screening purposes, because um, some boards have some actual requirements, right? Like there's certain things you're like, it's non-negotiable, you know, um, to get this job. There's certain things that are required. Um, and then there's some things that might be preferred. And so what you see at the bottom, um, we talk about people's experience, their credentials they may have, um, maybe it's language. And so the piece um, at the bottom was just sample language that has been used in other um, um, applica or I should say criteria. So that's what those are listed for. So it's really just for you to get an example of what we've used before, but it's really tonight you all need to determine what are those things that you require and what are those things that you prefer keeping in mind that if you require something that really determines for us to say, okay, we're screening someone out if they quote unquote don't have a doctorate degree, for example, because that comes up. And there's debates with boards about should someone have that or not. And we often as consultants recommend not having that as a requirement because there are people who you will screen out who would be great superintendents who may not have that degree. Um, but then you also have where you can make it a preference or you can determine like what type of education, level of education they have. So you determine that, but just want to have you um, give us that indication tonight of what might be your requirements or preferences. And so those are just examples of certain things people have used um, in this particular um, criteria. Could I just ask of staff? For our um, assistant superintendents, doctorate is preferred. Is that how it's listed on listings? It, yes. Okay. So I would venture to say we would Consistent. definitely want that. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm looking at all these and I'm thinking, I, I think I would prefer all of them. I'm not sure I would require <laughs> any of them to lock somebody out. Is there, I mean, I've gone down this the sample language list. I'm, you know, we would want to maybe agree on the languages on that last one, but for me, all of these look like great prefer, uh, preferred rather than mm -hmm. required. I don't know if people feel any different. Are there requirements that people would want? Yeah, I, I think, it, well, I, I don't understand the Vietnamese, but... Um, these they... are just samples. That okay. was all. It was just a sample yeah. from a district who that was a primary language in their district, so they wanted to make sure that... that so it's just samples. I'm going to take all this off of here, but it's just examples. Okay. That was it. Um, I, I guess I'm, I'm less concerned about the ability to speak any particular language other than English. Um, I, I don't want to say that, you know, we're, we're you know, rolling other people out. Uh, but um, I think if, with the word preferred on these, I could probably be comfortable with them. Um, I mean, some of them I think are more important than others. Uh, but as long as we're not rolling anybody out because... Uh, you know, we provide preferred. Um, I mean, if the board agrees, uh, 
I'm open to any of those. Other than that, I would take the enemies out. Yeah, this is I, just literally samples. Yeah. But so am I hearing you say that you'd have a pref? We would list a preference as the ability to speak um, um, Spanish and put that as just a preference, or is it not? Just I, I leave it out altogether. You, Miss Rita, I, to me, it's not. It don't list it as a preference or a requirement. Uh, okay, so just leave great. it off. I would leave it yeah. off. Okay. Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? I would do all of the rest of these on top, though. The, maybe the one I would wonder about is, is a master's degree or higher uh, with a proven record and desire of continuous learning is required. I guess a master's degree, is that something we want to be required rather than just preferred? Well, that's a good point. I mean, I think a, a, a doctorate is preferred, but a master's degree, I think, would be required. Okay. Yeah, required for SS. Mm -hmm. So if the master's degree is required, On yeah, it just is a higher... I yeah. think for, for our assistant soups, it's just something the level of a, what was it, advanced, advanced degree okay. advanced is what it degree. says for us. And then just so you know, on our current superintendent job description, we do have one. Um, it does say any combination of education and experience equivalent to a master's degree in five years of increasing responsible management experience. And then also it does say possession of a valid California Clear Administrative Services credential. Mm -hmm. So that's on our current job description. Yeah, I'm fine with requiring the administrative credential as well. Okay. Um, so, so, so is it easier just maybe utilize the language you already have to keep it consistent? Would I kind of like an advanced degree um, rather than the, the real, the wordy one that's on there now. Yeah. We said required for an advanced degree and then a requirement of an administrative okay. credential. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. President, I'm kind of stuck on this, um, the ability to speak Spanish. <sighs> Is it possible to say the ability to speak uh, another foreign language or just a foreign language fluently? Yeah, no, I think we're, sense. I mean, know, we're, and we've discussed potentially just taking it out altogether, not having any language. And if it's important for us that somebody speaks another language, we can leave it on there. But I don't, I don't to me, it's not a, a deal breaker. Well, and, and knowing that our district is very <laughs> diverse yeah, with the language, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just, I'm looking at that and it kind of limits us. I mean, yeah. Why would we all Maybe be... some that are speaking fluent French yeah. or, I don't know. Sure, Russian, yeah. Or Russian yeah. or, yeah. Or, yeah. Would, would, so we, would we all be comfortable just not having this as a preference yeah. or a requirement? Ms. Anderson, have you? You know, most districts in California have Spanish listed just based because. on that is a language that is continuously growing um, and being spoken from our amazing kids and families. So it, it doesn't change like it's so part of this is you're giving us direction on how we screen. Right. right. So if you say I have a preference, then that's questions we ask them. Right. Those are things that we have on our radar. So if you don't list it, it still probably is going to come up, right? So as you're interviewing people, it's going to show up maybe on their um, their resumes, you name it. Um, so it's really up to you what you value in this space. Um, I think that there are a lot of people who also will say, well, I don't know another language, but they have great abilities to interact with people and to really utilize interpretation effectively. They have good cultural proficiency skills where they're able to um, use body language and relationship building and understanding of other cultures to speak to people and communicate without knowing the language. So I think those are things to me that have always been more valuable beyond just I can speak the, the language of our families. However, every district is different and that valuable experience of having a superintendent to be able to go into a community and can speak the language that's other than English is also a great value as well. But it, it, it's really, you all have to determine like, is that gonna be the greatest impact or, you know, or make, um, it, you have to determine that. And every district that, I mean, we have a lot of, I, I, you know, I'm going to do that kind of research on the folks we've placed of how many actually have, were bilingual, you name it. But it, it always has been a preference. It never has been a requirement. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think if, if we have it, I, I maybe would just have Spanish and as a preference. But again, I, my, pref, my preference would be just to take it out altogether. Ms. Cabrera, would you be able to answer um, approximately how many of our student population speak Spanish? We have generally in the last 
I'd say 10 years, have teetered around 25%. That number translates to about 5,000 students. So it is a significant language in our district. Um, as a comparison um, to other languages, um, when you look at the different languages other than English, it is 33, almost 34%. And the second language currently in our district is Telugu, Telugu which is 8%. So it is a, a, okay. a vast uh, difference. So with those numbers, I would venture to say I would like to leave it because I think that being able to communicate with a such large population that typically is not involved would be a huge benefit to us. And we'll just leave Spanish in there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I'm happy with that. Yeah, I yeah. think especially since we just hired a principal and a new AP at Mitchell who have those skills, um, you know, I think that's kind of some of the movement that we're moving Got towards. It. So I think if we just leave it as a preference. Okay. So just to confirm, a preference won't mean that you're you're discounting applicants who, who only speak. No, it just English. helps us to know to ask that question and to be mindful of it versus where language is not necessarily a criteria to have a superintendent job, right? But it's helpful for us to know as we're screening to ask those questions and also as we're doing our reference checks, when you think about communities they serve who may speak Spanish, for example, those are things we can ask in our references too. Um, so yeah, it's just helpful, but it wouldn't screen anyone out um, at all. It's just helping us to keep it on the radar. Yeah, I, I, I'd be yeah. fine if it's a preference. I just don't yeah. want to discriminate against people who aren't multilingual. Oh yeah, yeah, never, never that. Because the criteria for your job is above all of this, right? That is the criteria, and uh, there's many superintendents who are not bilingual, multilingual, and do a phenomenal job. So definitely not. But it is about if you're having when you call out equity leader. Right, language is one of those things that fall into the work of equity, and so um, I think being mindful of that um, is super important. Um, it shows you value that, um, and so I think it's fine. And so we'll definitely keep that in mind. Um, anything else that pops up for you? Um, I know one of the things that um, we'll, we'll, I guess, align the language um, around what you currently have for the uh, credential piece, um, the, the advanced degrees. I'm sorry. Does that sound okay? If we keep yeah. that. Okay. If I, I, I just have to say so. Yeah. <clears throat> the state of California does not require a California administrative credential. The governor of Colorado became the superintendent of LA Unified. Not to say that's somebody you want to Im 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 imitate, but uh, I think that, especially for out of state, because we are a national yeah. firm. If they're from out of state and they see that, they may not apply. That's so if, what if we left uh, how it is in here now, a requirement to possess or be able to obtain a California administrative credential? Or why not just an administrative credential? Do other states have administrative credentials? And Well, they do, but they probably have it from their state. Right, but if you delete just the word California and just say possess or be able to obtain an administrative credential, would that create that flexibility? Uh, sure, sure, if you, that's what you want to do. I, myself, it's, taken out. Uh, it's your decision, okay. your decision. Yeah, and, and I don't know if we, majority of these, we actually haven't had people list that. Like, these are examples, but some have not even listed that. Um, well, and, okay. and to his point, you know, there, there's, there's not a requirement, there's no requirement to be a superintendent. So I think that's the piece that you have to decide, you know. Um, I think the California piece is what's helpful when you have people coming from out of state because there is something to be said about obtaining that yeah. means that you would have to learn about the laws and ed code, you name it. So um, it's up to you all. You don't even have to list it if you want. It's just these uh, were no, example I'm, language. I'm so. happy putting it back into preference. Uh, okay. if, if we do that, if everybody's okay with that. Right, that possess point, then, or be able to obtain. Yeah, and okay. at that point then, the, the only requirement would be an advanced degree. The preferences would be yep. successful experience as a teacher and leader at the classroom site and district level. Okay, strong is that one you want to put in? For preference, yeah. Strong working knowledge of best business practices and budget development. I would like to leave that in as a preference. So can I, can I go to the first one? So I want to um, mm -hmm. get clarity on the successful experience as teacher and leader at the classroom site district levels. So do you when you say teacher, you want to be really careful because we have superintendents who don't take that route, right? You've had mm -hmm. folks who have been through a different path to become a superintendent. So do you want to, because you kind of put people in a, or, or is that your preference? Well, I think is that we're, yeah, the only requirement I think right now we have is the advanced degree okay. language. So preference so the, is? The preference as a teacher okay. and leader. Or, Got it, okay. 
Okay. And uh, okay, right. so that was one bullet. And then your second one. The strong working knowledge of best business practices and budget development. Okay. As a prefer these are all preferences now. Okay. Possess or be able to obtain a California administrative credential. Yep, got that one. That's, that's a preference. As a preference. Mm -hmm. Yep. A doctoral degree in their chosen field is a preference. Uh, the, the ability to speak Spanish is a preference. And then I, I would leave in the uh, second to last one, the California administrative experience at the cabinet levels is a preference as well. Okay. So is there any, is there any that's required? The, the yeah, advanced degree. Advanced degree, okay. And everything before this Correct. in our <laughs> list of <laughs> yeah, <everything>. qualifications. <laughs> And so the cabinet levels prefer, right? Okay, that's helpful. Um, most of the people who apply for the job are have had experience at the cabinet level, but there are always a sprinkle who don't. And it's important you tell us because we will screen out people who may have not had those experiences. Um, although we never like to rule it out. There's some folks who have skipped from like principal to superintendent. So we don't wanna ever exclude someone who could be skilled at it, but it's helpful for us to know um, and we often look at like numbers of years, like what is their experience and understanding the full scope of, of the, the system outside of just, you know, the instructional side, right? So like you mentioned budget, which is really important. Um, obviously some of the things that you're gonna have to deal with with reorg and your, your facilities, you name it. Um, so I think you've covered quite a bit um, and I feel really good. So if I can get that language, Sean, from you, that would help to align the one requirement just to align that. And other than that, I think we have what we need if you feel good about your criteria. I have one more thing uh -huh. to go back yep. to, and I'm okay. sorry. No problem. Um, under an educational equity leader, uh -huh. um, where it lists out, act upon all decisions through an equity diversity, I would love to see anti-racist and inclusion lens. Mm -hmm. So add in anti-racist before or after, it doesn't really matter where it goes, but I Everyone fine with that? It, well, it is a charged political wor uh, word that uh, has m many meanings uh, and can be a very divisive word. I would prefer not mm -hmm. um, bring in something that would be overtly political. Mm -hmm. at the, the, that wouldn't be universally understood mm -hmm. and cause division within the community. That would be my preference to not mm -hmm. use that word. I'm going to venture to disagree that racism is political. No, no, <laughs> so, no, 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 not um, racism. You so, said or, the, or the opposite, oh, being anti-racist. Anti so mm -hmm. um, I, I would stand on the side that that's not political. That is a very real situation for many of our students, staff, community. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we are work working towards equity, we also have to be working towards anti-racism. And I think that that is something that we I, should then want I, to be I, behind. I, I would suggest rather than using that word, I would have um, a, a alternative suggestion, which would be under an effective educator at the very last sentence uh, where it says, in access gaps for target student groups, uh, I would put comma, including but not limited to race and gender. So you're, you're, I think you all are wrestling with a really good, you know, kind of um, um, challenge around about language. So I would say um, we typically, so, just my background is is dealing with equity, diversity, inclusion work for a daily, like on a daily basis. And as a consultant with McPherson, this particular equity leader um, criteria is one that I really influenced, I will say. Um, so I'm pretty um, adamant about language, but also recognize you have to call things out, but also we don't want to do is create what I would say, not even a political charge, but more of confusion. So if this is part of a job description, I don't know if everyone would even say that I have evidence of being an anti-racist. And I think that's my concern is we have not evolved in education to get that far. So it actually will eliminate a lot of people is where I'm going. So what I would say, and this is my recommendation, I think I took this out. So I'm glad you called it out, is the last sentence in that piece uh, under um, educational equity leader, the last sentence, 
um, where it says perpetuate all forms of oppression. I think the original language we had was racism, and I think we we called out several isms and all forms of oppression, right? Because there's so many, we don't like to play what we call oppression Olympics to say who was what's more important. But I think that language is important to call out. So I think. Um, Trusty Reed, we can place it in that space where yeah, you'd I'd, recommend I'd, it, or I'd we can place it under equity leader. We can do both. Yeah, I'd be fine with uh, all forms of racism, discrimination, and or oppression. I just don't want to use the, the term anti-racist. And I, if, if we do go that way, I mean, it's just that's still something we can bring up in the interview. You know, oh, yeah, you can have questions and things that. like that. That yeah. Actually, that's probably a better way to do it. I Thank you for bringing that up. Because you do want to know, like, it's one thing to apply for the job, but, like, I can apply and I can tell you what I do, but you want evidence of it and you want to hear the language and you want to hear, like, how they've actually, um, you know, shown evidence of that work. So if you're okay with it, I can adjust the language to put it at that last sentence of perpetuate racism and all forms of oppression. Um, I can add in um, there's a lot of isms we can be all day going through all those and that's why I just put all forms of oppression so that it is very clear that we're talking about um, literally we're not leaving anyone out because I think that's important too um, and then we can also add language in that effective educator under where it says access um, gaps for target student groups and you can call out including I think you said ethnicity or race and gender I think is what I heard race you say. and gender yeah. yeah and so that sound kind of a good balance? Yeah? Yeah. Are you sure? Okay. It'll feel better later. I'll feel I, better I when feel I get those yeah. questions for the interview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Uh, we we wrestle with language all the time. And so, I think yeah. I think for, for us as a district, we've done so much work in equity okay. that now it's time to take the step forward. Yep. And so you I would love yep. to see that person that's ready to take yep. that one step further than yep. that. So... Okay. That, that is my reason behind that. Um, okay. And I think that we've come a long ways, but we still have a long ways yep. to go. So, And so that helps us when we talk to applicants too, because we do kind of do many interviews with them before they even apply. And so when they, some of them even ask for input for, from us around their application and how they respond. Because I, what I want to emphasize is in the application, these five criteria, they have to speak to these. So I think that's really helpful also to see how they respond even in that point. Um, so I think you have it in multiple places, which is perfect. So, um, any other language you want to consider before we close it out? Strong. All right. That was... So speak now or forever hold your peace because this is going to print. So next steps, okay? Um, literally today's Thursday. Um, nothing will happen for um, advertisement until next week. Um, I know like AXA, for example, has a certain cycle of when it goes into like EdCal, you name it. So if for any reason you have like some, um, you know, epiphany, like you're like, okay, there's a word that's driving me nuts. You can let me know um, and I can literally make a, a small tweak here and there. Nothing where we're wordsmithing this whole thing over. But if there's something between now and like Monday that comes up, just email. Um, and then I can, you know, literally um, make a small adjustment based on the discussion that you've had. Um, but I feel like like after tonight, you really do want to put a pin in it, knowing that this is still a draft, because remember, you can come back to this on March 17th to make adjustments based on the input from your stakeholders. Uh, March 7th. Yep. Yeah. I think I said yeah, 17th. 17th is... Don't come back on the 17th. <laughs> but yeah. So y'all feel pretty good about where we are? Yeah. You're like, we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. Yeah, it's an important no, it's decision, good. it's tough. But y'all did great. Um, thank you for your time and, and thoughtfulness in this. Um, we look forward to working with the staff to roll out your input sessions. Anything comes up um, is in the email we shared. Just reach out. Um, we're here for you through the whole process. We'll see you again on March the 7th, technically, but on the 15th when y'all meet again, if there's anything you need to like discuss, um, just reach out to us. Um, we won't be here physically with you for that day, but we can definitely be available to give you any input if you have questions. So we're with you the, all the, the whole way, all the way to the end and beyond. So thank you again for your time and for um, efforts in this. Thank you again, staff, for tolerating our back and forth emails. Like the staff's gonna be tired of us. And thank you, Sean, for 
volunteer. I think I said congratulations, right? You remember I said that point of contact? But for the team, thank you all for your for your help in this, and just um, just excited to be a partner with you on it. So well, we appreciate with that, it. Yeah. yeah, we'll be out of your way. Thanks, and thanks for staying with us a little bit late tonight. Of course, of course. Yeah. yeah. I just uh, Matthew, did you have did you get your question answered? You did. Okay. Good. All right. Great. Thank you both. All right. All right. Thank you. Good night. Uh, it is a discussion item. We'll bring it out to the for public comment. I don't have any cards here in person. It looks like there's nobody online, so we will close that one up and move to discussion item C: budget update, governor's budget uh, proposed budget for 2024-25. Mr. Martin, or sorry, yeah. Dr. Kalikian. Yes. Uh, Mr. Martin will be presenting the highlights of the governor's proposed budget for 24-25, so we'll invite him to share his presentation. Yes, good evening. Uh, actually, this will be relatively quickly. There's not a lot to the governor's budget. Um, he is fully funding the COLA, uh, and as soon as we have the presentation up, there we go. Thank you, Rochelle. Uh, the governor's proposal, the biggest thing I think it would say is, is that the governor has a lot of assumptions in there when it comes to the, the collection of, of taxes because his deficit amount is about $30 billion different than what legislative analyst office, which means potentially there will be uh, some additional adjustments to the budget when we actually get to May um, and the governor has his next uh, updated budget cycle. Um, but what I will tell you at this point is um, it really honestly for how poor the state budget looks at this point and how big of a shortfall, it, it actually doesn't sound very bad for education. Um, we consider this a COLA only budget in the sense that we're not really looking at any new funding or programs of significant impact to Folsom Cordova at least, uh, but we are projecting that the COLA will, or the governor's projecting that the COLA will be funded. The biggest thing though here is from what we had at assumptions, is that the COLA did drop significantly from uh, previous assumptions of 3.94% down to 0.76%. Um, so that's that's a significant decrease um, and equates to, from what we had at first interim, about a $7.6 million increase in LCFF funding. And you have to remember, because COLA is ongoing, that, that's a decrease ongoing. So that's a decrease of $7.6 million every year. And when we built out the multi-year, we had occluded that in two years. So that's, you know, $15 million swing in revenues. Uh, as you see in the bottom right corner, there's a little box. You can see 2526. Also, COLA is less than what we what was projected uh, originally, and 2627 is pretty close. Um, but we're hoping, we're hearing that potentially the COLA could be a little bit higher. Um, it's whether or not the governor would be able to fund it or not. Um, keeping in mind that there is a stabilization fund, a rainy day fund, if you will, that was specifically created for education. Um, and the, the, what we're hearing is that the governor would pr pretty much uh, access those funds potentially to, to fully fund the COLA for whatever it ends up being. Um, I think long term, you know, we are hearing that the state budget in general in the long term looks uh, good in the fact that, and we'll talk about that in a second, in the fact that um, inflation is stabilizing. Um, we're hearing that interest rates may start actually holding or dropping. Um, the Fed just met the other day and they held rates. Potentially, if interest rates drop, that would probably be a positive to the stock market. And as we know, we talked about the fact that 60% of the state's income comes from 1% of the population, and those folks make their money off the stock market. And so if the stock market does well, California's economy normally follows. So um, continuing on, other things uh, that we should talk about, attendance and enrollment is looking good. Um, that's a, a very good positive. That's, that's specific to, obviously, our community. But we are uh, projected up from first interim. Um, we actually see uh, about a 95 ADA increase over what we projected at first interim. Now, that's as of month six, and we have a couple more months. Uh, we go through about mid-March. Uh, and so right now, I will tell you that attendance rates are not the best. We are having a, a pretty significant impact because of cold and flu season, COVID, those kind of things. And so um, we are seeing attendance rates. Uh, normally, this happens this time of year. So you know, the 95 ADA increase is a snapshot as of, of month six, which would have been um, bef before Dece right around December. So, um, and so we are hoping that we hold and be close to that because that would bring additional revenues that were not in the budget at first interim. 
So about a million dollars. So that would hopefully offset some of that COLA loss um, that we had. Um, and you can see that since CalPADS in October, we're up 116 students, net up 116 students, because we lose students. And in the spring, we normally drop students because uh, seniors graduate out early, um, and then um, that's just the normal transition that we have. Uh, other items in, that's in the governor's budget or as part of the process for next year, we are seeing that PERS rates will continue to increase. You can see that it's going from 26.68 to 27.8, so another about 1% increase. I mean, we're getting to the point now where the contribution, um, when you talk, you add in uh, PERS and STRS and you add in um, Social Security for the classified folks, it's, a, it's equating to over 40%. So there's, you know, when, you, when we start looking at the cost, you have to add about a 40% increase to that. Um, and then we also have health and welfare benefits. So um, there's a lot of additional costs that aren't recognized as salary or hourly rate that we have to recognize. And that's what comes into minimum wage. I know we had a meeting earlier in the week um, with the um, uh, Budget Advisory Committee, and we talked a little bit about minimum wage and whether or not the $20 an hour rate that the fast food industry has to pay now for, for, for uh, employees, would, how that would impact us or would it impact us. And the, legally, there's no requirement. We're not, we're not, we don't fall under that law. But obviously it does. I mean, having a $20 hourly rate is, uh, you know, I think our lowest rate is uh, $20 an hour. For, yeah, we do have yard supervision that's a little less. Yeah, eighteen twenty for yards. Thank you, Don. Um, eighteen twenty for yards. But one of the things that you know we would speak to is that yes, you know we might pay the same, but you have to remember we have a a set schedule. Uh, you have you you know you qualify potentially if you work enough hours, you qualify for a pension, a retirement pension. Um, we offer if you're over uh, six hours uh, a day, you get um, dental and vision, one hundred percent covered, and you have a medical cap. Um, and so, you know, I think there are a lot of additional benefits that we have that if you look at beyond just the hourly rate, we're very, you know, we're, we're more than competitive. Um, and so th I think those are kind of where we are um, as a district. And so really at this point, we're, we're going to continue. We're already building. We already met uh, last week. We met with all of our school sites to uh, give them their allocations and go over their plans for next year. We reviewed staffing for next year as well. Um, and so uh, we are moving along with 24-25 budget. It just, it's a continuous cycle and we are, have started up that process. Uh, the next major hurdle for us is uh, we'll have second interim in March. Um, in May, we have the May revise from the, the governor and then they, they negotiate with the legislature and then we have the budget enacted in June. Um, here's our timeline for all the activities. We have our data walks going on. Ms. Cabrera and her team are running all of those. Um, you see March 2nd interim, and then in May, we'll have the governor's revised budget, um, and we'll be using that as our final pieces. At that point, we'll have about 80 to 90% of the budget done. Um, remember, adopted budget has a tons of assumptions in it, so we'll have all the assumptions in at that point, um, except for the governor's information. Um, and then we'll come in June for approval. So any questions on that? Any questions? All right, great job, thank you. Uh, it is a discussion I will bring it out to public. I have nothing in front of me here, so nothing in person, any online comments? Nobody online. All right, well then that brings us to item 13, superintendent's report. Dr. Kligan. Yes, thank you. Um, I wanted to acknowledge the students that came again from Vista Del Lago and just let the board know I'll be reaching out to them directly and have a conversation with them. and. Um, we had reviewed the school calendar, which was one of the things the board approved tonight. We don't show Columbus Day on there, but we have an administrative regulation where we address many different um, acknowledgement of different days. So I'll, I'll share that with them, but I'll, I'll personally reach out. And I know Josie and Maya came last time, so I'll, I'll reach out, I'll start there. Um, I also wanna thank FCLA for highlighting um, our two schools that offer students choice and options through Innovations Academy and Walnutwood. Um, again, uh, knowing that not all students uh, succeed with the same traditional type of program and giving them those options, um, I'm just you know very uh, thankful that our district offers that. And we've got great leadership and, and teachers at those sites as well. And then lastly, just a reminder that SCOE Trustees Dinner is next week, uh, Wednesday, February 7th, 
The topic presenter is speaking on artificial intelligence. It's Sean Roberts from code.org. Um, and I only have one board member signed up so far that's joining me. So it starts at around six o'clock. Me, you're speaking. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think it's Jen. So if you're interested, we need to RSVP. So just let me or Rochelle know. That's it. Thank you so much. All right, then item 14, board member reports. Start with the student board member, Mr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, there's only one of me tonight, but uh, Van sends his well wishes to everyone. And um, I just want to recognize, first of all, that it is the beginning of Black History Month. So I want to recognize the generous contributions that the students, staff, faculty of this district have in co contributing to their school culture and community. So I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, second of all, I'd want to thank the students again from VISA coming out, continuously advocating for the recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day and their collaborations recently with the um, Native American groups that have also shown up recently. And that's really a segue into discussing how we can implement those Title VI um, supplemental uh, educational programs in this district. And then lastly, I just want to recognize the presentations from the individuals at Mon uh, the Montessori, as well as the Innovations and Walnut Wood Academies. That's once again, just another way that we can promote educational inclusivity through alternative educational programs. But other than that, nothing much. Thank you. Ms. Lofthouse. Um, I also wanted to start off by saying happy Black History Month. I look forward to see seeing what the sites do. Um, it's one of my favorite times to come and visit and read stories and kind of see all of the different displays at the schools and conversations. So um, thank you to the students from VISTA for coming out again. Uh, good luck to all the students that are starting the LPAC. And I look forward to many of them coming to um, celebrate them reclassifying. And I did want to speak um, to sharing sentiments about uh, communication needing some improvement with regards to student safety at Blanche Sprints. Um, I was in constant contact with one specific parent who actually went to the arraignment of the gentleman who was arrested and ensured safety on our school sites um, by getting a stay away order for, for the school sites. And so, with that, I really hope that there's greater communication between, I think, I think where it fell was between the police department and our school district. Um, and so I'm really hoping that there's better communication between the police department, especially when there's an individual that's had repeated offenses and was not a safe individual. And so um, I feel like we kind of got lucky in a bad situation. And so, um, and we happened to have a parent who was very engaged and involved and, and knew enough people and things to get things done um, to protect our students. But I would like to urge uh, greater communication, especially between our school safety and um, the police departments in situations that occur on or around our campuses. Um, and then I um, look forward to visiting Ms. Tara's classroom tomorrow. Um, and Thank you to all the little students that come out. I'm um, greatly missing our music performances and uh, student performances. So I'm hoping that, that those can come back because uh, seeing students in our audience is one of my favorite things. So that's all. Thanks. Ms. Larry? Um, yeah, not much for me tonight. Um, I just, I love the juxtaposition of having our little TKers with our high schoolers coming to speak at the boards, uh, board meetings, and uh, just want to commend all the students that come out, um, you know, the little ones that come out, and they're super brave, and I appreciate everything that they're learning in schools and in their homes that get, empower them to be able to come and speak and uh, have that translate as they go through their educational process. Um, tomorrow I will be headed to Navigator for their Jogathon, so looking forward to that and uh, weather permitting. So we're going to hope that the rain holds out for us. So other than that, that's it for me. Thank you. Mr. Reed. Yeah, uh, I just want to uh, quickly chat about uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. I, I, there, there might be a, a more elegant solution since Columbus Day is not a holiday um, that we uh, recognize. Um, it just happens that over the last several years, we've used that as a professional development day, but if we didn't use it as a professional development day, it would be a school day. 
Thanksgiving is, uh, what's that, the third Thursday of, of every uh, November. Um, <laughs> there is such thing, uh, it's called Native American Heritage Day. It's actually Congress uh, passed it by a unanimous vote. How often does Congress pass anything by unanimous vote? Uh, but it was passed and signed into law by President Bush in uh, 2008, uh, and it declares the Friday after Thanksgiving as Native American Heritage Day. Now that is a day we have off from school. So maybe a more elegant solution would be to recognize Thanksgiving on our calendar as a Thursday and Native American Heritage Day as the Friday that we have off that week. Um, anyway, uh, that's just uh, a quick uh, observation that I wanted to share. Although I would also point out that the state of California also has a day uh, that was signed into law by Governor Reagan in 1968, 67, uh, which declares, and there's only two states in the country that, uh, that does this, uh, Native American Day, it's a little different wording than the other one, but Native American Day in the state of California is the fourth Friday of September. But the fourth Friday of September is not a day off, so I think the more elegant solution if we want to do something uh, is to look at the, the holiday that Congress uh, passed unanimously and was signed into law by uh, President Bush. So uh, other than that, I have uh, nothing to share. Right, thank you. Mr. Clark. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out uh, with this district, um, I wanted to talk about my current role with GSUL and you know, I'm fortunate enough to work with our foster youth program um, in the surrounding districts, Sac City, Twin Rivers, San Juan. Um, and when I consult with those districts, I see the amount of staff that's dedicated uh, to the foster youth program. And, you know, I was actually at a CSBA uh, director's meeting last weekend, and I talked to a few of my colleagues about that specifically. and they have staff and it's just, I'm kind of shocked that our foster youth program doesn't have the support that it needs, not like these other districts. Um, I remember a parent coming to a board meeting a few weeks ago and, and asked for more staffing in the department. Now this was a parent asking for more support. Um, we have to keep in mind that our foster youth are an LCAP group, so I just want to know how come we're not staffing it as adequately as other districts are doing. Um, so hopefully, Mr. Superintendent, you can kind of loop the board in on that. Um, uh, happy Black History Month. Um, I'm hoping to get out to the schools to see what they're doing. I'm not sure if we can get our principals to send out like a list of activities or uh, something that's happening. I know uh, Cordova Villa normally has a uh, celebration. Um, I know Peter J. Schiltz does. I'm just wondering who else out there has those. Um, I wanted to touch on Indigenous Peoples Day and, and I understand what uh, Board member Reed is saying about the other holidays, but you know, if it falls on a PD day, then we can still recognize it. But if it doesn't, maybe we can dedicate that day to just Native American activities, uh, just to celebrate them a little bit more. Um, and then uh, let's see. I thank the students from VISTA coming out to talk about that. Uh, I want to thank IMPACT for coming out and talking about um, the Title VI. Um, I think last meeting I asked for hopefully board consensus on um, talking about land acknowledgement and what that would look like. So hopefully I would get an answer on that. And uh, Elena, oh, she's not there, so I'm talking to a chair. Um, I'm looking forward to going to the Parent Summit this uh, Saturday. I know that uh, Gene and I are donating 
a few raffle prizes. So um, look forward to being there and participating with the student, uh, parents and students. And um, that's about it. Thank you. A uh, quick report from me as well tonight. Uh, again, want to thank Angie and your team uh, for both of these issues, the TK and for the Montessori. And uh, I said it before, but I, I just appreciate seeing the collaboration happening and the work you've put into um, trying to make sure that we can take care of the parents that are excited about this program. Uh, and on that note, also, I, I wasn't able to get out there, but just want to acknowledge and thank Mr. Clark for getting out to the Montessori class today, uh, I think, and Ms. Lofthouse, who's heading out there tomorrow. Uh, it's comfort comforting for me to know, even if I can't make it, that uh, you guys are representing us out there. So uh, I appreciate it. I know it helps fill in our idea of uh, what's going on in that classroom. So um, thank you for making the time to do that. Um, otherwise, I just wanted to point out, uh, speaking of Mr. Clark, uh, our next board meeting, February 15th, we are going to be talking about uh, ROTC. So uh, you know, get ready for that. That should be fun. Uh, that's it for my report, which does bring us to advanced planning. We'll get back to ROTC in a second. The next board meeting, regularly scheduled board meeting, is February 15th. Believe it or not, we just have two board meetings this month, I think. <laughs> that's the plan. Uh, so we'll see you back there then. Uh, item B is our 12-month board calendar. That's there for your review. Item C is suggested future agenda items uh, that ROTC program was suggested on August 10th. We'll be talking about it at our next meeting. Is there any other suggested future agenda items anybody would like to um, consider? Um, I would love to be able to have an actual discussion on Indigenous Peoples Day. So I would love to see that on a future agenda item. And then I would also kind of follow up, would love to, maybe it can be included in that, but a conversation about um, adding a land acknowledgement to the beginning of our meeting along with a flag salute, so. Um, other board members, I'd be happy to uh, support that as well. Both of those, it seems like, I would like those maybe to be two separate things, but. Yeah. Um, sounds like everybody's good with that. <laughs> okay, uh, so Superintendent, you're good with that. We've got the land acknowledgement as well as uh, Indigenous Peoples Day as a discussion item, sounds like. Um, anything else? Um, I was wondering if we uh, could postpone the discussion on uh, ROTC uh, to the first meeting in March. Um, it's an item that I had rec or asked to be on uh, an agenda. Um, I suspect on the March or the February 15th meeting, I'm going to have to leave very early um, to get to the airport. I'm taking my son on a college visit in Wyoming. Um, and I don't want to miss that, that discussion. I'd be fine with that. Everybody else okay with that? Yeah, so we're, uh, we're just asking that we'd move the ROTC uh, discussion one meeting later. Correct. Okay. Mr. President, I know a board member Lofthouse mentioned the land acknowledgement in people's, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day. There's something reference, referencing that in May. Do you think we could push it forward so it could be in February or March or even earlier? Uh, yeah, I would recommend maybe that if Dr. Clean, if you can take a look at our calendar, to see if yeah, see I'll, what does I'll take work. a look at our calendar, and um, I really would like to have the dialogue with the Native American Parent Advisory Committee and the uh, the group that we saw tonight in the last meeting, and get their feedback too. So we'll we'll see if we can um, do that sooner. Mm -hmm. Thank but you. I'll have to look at our calendar. I think it makes sense to try for that. I'm just thinking if we don't get in before March, April's such a crazy month between the search committee um, or the, the doing that superintendent search that it may end up being May. Maybe if we can pull that, ROT, if we move that ROTC, it can fill that spot because I have a feeling those people would be very willing to have conversations <laughs> before next meeting. So well, I think the, the main part is yeah. making sure that you get a chance to But speak I think with the, the group. indigenous or NAPAC is meeting on the 12th? Yeah. Yeah, so that could work. Okay. Uh, if I'd be comfortable saying if you wanted to look at the counter, see what makes sense, and then um, if, if we can get it there and yes. we feel prepared for that there, I'm happy to do that on the 15th. So. We'll, we'll do our best. No promises. Okay. It might be March. Okay. okay. Thank you for the uh, suggestion, Mr. Mildred, though. Um, 
Okay, great. I think we're all okay then uh, moving ROTC to March 7th. Um, not hearing any objections to that. So if there's no other uh, suggested future agenda items that will bring us to uh, all the way down to item 20. We don't need to go back into closed session, which is adjournment. Uh, so unless I hear any objections, we will adjourn. Hearing no objections, we are adjourned. Thank you.